six o'clock and I want to go ahead and call the Temple City Unified School District regular meeting of the Board of Education to order. And let's do a roll call vote. I'm going to roll call first for attendance. Item number two. Um, I am here. Donna Giorgino, member Giorgino. Here. Member Sneed. Here. Member Lynn. Here. Member Smith. Yes, I'm here. Okay. With that, we will move on to public comment on closed session agenda items. Um, I was told by Marie a few minutes ago that we have no public comment on closed session agenda items. Is that right? Yeah, I don't know if Marie's here, but I believe that is the case. Was. It was just two minutes ago where she told me that was the case. Um, okay, so moving on to item four, closed session. Um, we will be discussing during closed session, we will be discussing personnel matters under government code 54957, public employee appointment, discipline, dismissal, release. And item number two, conference with labor negotiators, government code 54957.6, designated representative, Melissa Espinoza, board president and Candace Bondion, legal counsel for Temple City Unified School District, unrepresented employee superintendent. May I have a motion and a second to adjourn to closed session. I move. Okay, I have a motion for member Sneed and a second for member Lynn. Let's go ahead and take a vote. Um, member Lynn? Yes. Member Sneed? Yes. Member Giorgino? Yes. Member Smith? Yes. And I'm a yes. Um, so with a vote of five zero, we move to closed session. So we shall see you on the other side, folks.
Good evening, everybody. Welcome. Thanks for joining us tonight. We're going to go ahead and go to item six to reconvene to open session by roll call vote. Um, and let's go ahead and can I get a motion? So moved. Motion by member Smith. Second. Second by member Lynn. And the vote, uh, I'm a yes. Member Giorgino. Do we have member Georgino? She's got her picture. Yeah, let's see. Yes, member Georgino. She, okay, well, we'll go, we'll go, we'll go back to George, no, member Georgino. Uh, member Sneed? Yes. Member Lynn? Yes. Member Smith? Yes. Member Georgino? Okay. Do I go ahead and just say- You can go ahead. She's, she'll be joining okay. us in a minute or so. Yeah, I mean, I see her. She's just on mute and her picture's there. So we will go ahead and um, that motion passes um, four and then um, the zero. fifth, four, four, zero, four, zero. Okay. All right. So we are now back in open session. Um, item number seven, announcement tonight. The meeting is being digitally, digitally, digitally recorded. And we'll move on to item eight, which is, we'll start with the Pledge of Allegiance by member Lynn. Please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. And this will be followed by a moment of silence for TCUSD students, Anden Bay, Eric Gulickson, and Nicholas Torres. Uh, place your right hand over your heart. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Please remain standing and observe a moment of silence for our three students. We'll do one minute.
Thank you all. Seated. And along those lines, I, our board wants to extend deep, our deepest condolences to the families and the friends and all of those in our community that are hurting over the loss of Andon Bay, Eric Gullickson and Nicholas Torres. That said, we will move on to item number nine, announcements of actions taken in closed session. We had no actions taken, which takes us to item 10, changes to the agenda. Do we have any changes to the agenda? Hearing nothing, we'll move on to item 11 to approve the agenda by roll call vote. May I get a motion in a second? I move. Okay, member Sneed motion. Second. second. Member Giorgino seconds. And the vote, member Lynn. Yes. Our, our student board member. Yes. Okay. I was like, there's a there's a preferential vote coming up real soon here. Okay, um, preferential vote from uh, student board member Lee. Yes. Thank you. Um, and then we got, um, we already went to member Lynn, member Giorgino. Yes. Member Sneed. Yes. I'm a yes and member Smith. Uh, you're on mute. Yes, yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> no worries, no worries. Okay, that motion passes 5-0. Um, before we move on to item 12, I just want to remind the public that at item 24, there is going to be a uh, public hearing. So if you have any comments that you want to send um, during the public hearing to be read, please email public comment at tcusd.net and in the subject line, put public comment so that it can be read at item 24. All right, my favorite part of every meeting is the special recognition and presentation. And I understand we've got an MLK presentation and a presentation from Oak Avenue Intermediate School by Pr Principal Lesson. So let's start off with the MLK presentation. Mr. Holmes is gonna share his screen. Great. My name is Catherine Edwards. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And I am the Director of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion for the Los Angeles County Office of Education. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday is a day of service and civic engagement and a day of shared learning and reflection. The theme of this year's celebration is, it starts with me, shifting priorities to create the beloved community, a community free from poverty, racism, and violence, a community that lifts every voice and sings the song of humanity. We're in the third year, almost, of a global pandemic that is unlike any we have seen in a century. Folks are feeling frustrated, exhausted, or both. But it's not the first time that people have had to persevere in times of uncertainty and division. In 1966, Dr. King was being interviewed on the radio in Chicago when a high school student called in. The year before, she marched and participated in nonviolent civil disobedience, yet she didn't know it made a difference. Dr. King assured her that it had. Without a movement, injustice continues without questions or voices against it. Each act builds the atmosphere of a vibrant movement, he said, adding, often you are accomplishing more than you can see at the moment because you're in the heart of the situation. So while we are facing the ongoing threat of COVID-19 and grappling with the latest round of worries and headlines, our charge is to remember that we are accomplishing more than we can see at the moment and to keep moving forward, to keep building 
the beloved community. We're not where we were a year ago. We have greater access to vaccines, boosters, and testing to help keep us healthy and safe. Through this period of unique challenges, we have learned about ways to more effectively use whole child approaches to meet the social, emotional, and academic needs of our students. We've built the atmosphere of vibrant movements such as Black Lives Matter and Stop Anti-Asian Heat to confront inequity and bias. We've not always seen justice from the justice system, yet in recent memory, we have. We can look forward with hope and move forward with optimism. As Dr. King said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. We are stronger together, and together we have, we are, and we will keep bending that arc. Happy birthday, Dr. King. And from all of us at LACO, happy Martin Luther King Day to all of you. Thank you so much for that. I appreciate that. Um, we'll move on to Oak Avenue Intermediate School. Principal Lessam, how are you? <clears throat> Hi, everybody. Yes, I'm doing great. How are you? Good, good. Uh, so yeah, so first of all, I just want to really want to thank Executive Cabinet um, School Board members for allowing us to present tonight uh, some of the exciting developments that we have going on and coming up through Oak. I'm very excited to be here. Um, I brought a, a team with me because, as I say, it takes a village. So I have a team with me to, to present. Um, and I believe we do is uh, Ms. Porter, are you able to share our presentation? So um, while we're doing that, so, uh, you know, as I started in October, uh, I was really excited to come to Oak and, and to join the Temple City family. Um, and as I was kind of going through and, and figuring out where we were as a school and where we were um, with priorities and where we were kind of going in the direction, um, I discovered that we were getting right into the initial stages of uh, PBIS, which is, you know, a, a passion of mine. Um, I was is a program that I helped launch at my last school when I was the high school before here and seeing kind of where we were uh, to go through that and where we were at Oak and, and the progress that had been made. Um, I was really excited to be able to be on the ground floor and, and to help that get going. That's going to be one of the, the, the main topics that we, we speak about tonight. Um, so here we go. So um, as I was saying, PBIS, we're just getting to the initial stages of our rollout. Uh, we started actually just last week, we had a soft rollout to our faculty, really introducing the efforts that a, a, team, a team members have been doing over the last uh, two years, really. Um, this has been a process, and we'll get into as the night goes on, that that's really been going on. Uh, a really solid, great team from Oak has been putting together, really from the ground up, our, our initiatives, um, what the, our, our, our characters that we believe in. Um, through that, with our PBS, as it started rolling out, we kind of got into other things related to that that we wanted to start. So we have our, our Royal Den Student Center, where we'll be able to hold a lot of our initiatives and where we have our restorative circles and uh, resource center for students and our character camp, space camp. And I'd be remiss, I mean, we, the progress that we're that are just rolling out right now, um, I have to give a, a really special thanks to Susan Hemmins, who was principal before me, because um, the team that really she put in place and she had so much to do with this, uh, we would not nearly be where we are. If it wasn't for her and her leadership. So I'm extremely grateful for that, for the position that she put us in. Um, and I was able to kind of come in and, and just kind of get it off and, and get it off the ground. Um, so next, I'd like to introduce our team. Here is our PBIS committee that really has been working hard the last uh, two years. So we have our staff. Um, Ms. Gould, uh, Mr. Gus, he's one of our campus supervisors, Ms. Porter, our counselor, uh, Ms. Oliver, Ms. Borjali, Ms. Arigi, uh, Ms. Harrison, uh, Ms. Tina, who's another campus supervisor, uh, Mr. Will, who's our lead uh, custodian, our lead maintenance manager, and uh, Ms. Ho, um, not pictured as Ms. Ho, Ms. Zamora, and Mr. Taylor. So it's really a, a really cross set of teachers from all different departments and grade levels so that we really get a school-wide feel for how each department 
can interrelate mm -hmm. and work together. We also, it was important to have to have a committee of students uh, to be able to give their input. Um, a few of which are, are here tonight to, to present. Um, Atlanta Scott, uh, Eric Ramirez, Melody Chen, uh, Mia Orbelander, uh, Vivian De Leon, and Tobias Lang. Um, so this is really a team that's been, you know, with the support of executive cabinet who gave us time for pullout days, who gave us resources and trainings and really gave us the resources needed to, to launch this, um, which I'm extremely grateful for. Um, this team has really put it together and we're ready to do our rollout throughout the rest of this semester. Um, so next I'd like to introduce uh, Ms. Gould who'll kind of take us through how we got to the point where we are now. Thank you so much, Mr. Lesson. Um, and again, kudos to uh, the predecessors and Susan who helped sort of lead the charge and <laughs> give us time to get this going. In 2009, um, actually a, a group brought um, Oak folks together and we started the Royals Value Character. So this is embedded in Oak's DNA that we care about the kids, that we care about one another. And we started things like um, our character bracelets that students would be awarded when they were caught doing something good. And there was celebrations at the end of the year that, where families were invited. And then we have, um, as you can see in the slide here, our character garden where we have our six words that we really highly value. Then in 2017, we moved towards a multi-tiered system of support and we had training through our department chairs for that process. And then in 2019, um, when Susan took over and stuff, we actually started working with LACO in a really intensive program. And PBIS just seemed to really fit um, not only our district, but, but Oak, we really like more of a positive approach to working with our students. So um, from training, and then in 2001, we really honed in on who really wanted to be a part of, the, part of the team. So in that picture, you saw people that actually volunteered and that this is near and dear to their heart. Some of them have been doing this since 2009 and some are newcomers that um, got wind of this and thought, oh, I wanna be a part of this movement. And so oh, special thanks to uh, Ms. Borgiley and Ms. Porter who have continued to lead the charge and work behind the scenes. Um, as you can see behind me and my um, thing here, I, we've just gotten our posters that are really nice, big and beautiful. And we've posted all over the campus here within the month. Um, thank you to the Schools Foundation who helped uh, supply those. Uh, anyway, we are excited. And, and as 2022 continues, our students are helping us roll it out and uh, we are really proud of them. Thank you. Okay, so um, as Ms. Gould mentioned, at Oak, we had six words of character. And so rather than reinventing ourselves, we decided to kind of narrow our focus and really, you know, think about what was it that we value the most at Oak. And um, we thought that our three core values, which are compassion, integrity, and responsibility, were the three that really fit us the most. And coincidentally, it was also the three that would be the most similar for elementary school students coming uh, to Oak. Um, the elementary schools talk about being kind, and so that's our compassion. Um, they talk about um, being safe, um, that would be our integrity. And then responsibility, which again, the, is something that the elementary school preaches about being responsible. Um, so um, on this slide, I have our, uh, an example of our poster. You can see them also behind Ms. Gould. They're actually quite beautiful. Um, and we had our rollout on, for staff on Tuesday of last week. And we actually think it went really well um, and we were able to introduce all of the, the, the different forms that we would be using. Um, our goal now moving forward is to train staff on the Five Stars app. And so the Five Stars app is uh, something that the high school is using as well. And uh, for Oak to be right smack in the middle of the elementary schools and the, the high school, we want to try to provide this continuity between all three levels. And so... Um, at the elementary school, they use tickets or bucks. Um, we're going to award points.
complaints. And the cool thing about this is that if a teacher catches a student doing something positive, um, they will scan their ID with their phone. And then that way the kids can download this app as well and track their points. There's also a student store on the app where the kids will be able to see pictures and to a certain extent, do some online shopping for some things and for some incentives that they, that they want. Um, but for me personally, the best part of being a part of this committee are my team members. And I have some amazing team members um, starting from you know, our, our teachers that represent pretty much every department on campus um, to our custodians, our campus supervisors, but then also our wonderful, wonderful students, which we have tonight. And I'm going to, I have the privilege of introducing them. Um, we're gonna ask them a question and they're gonna kind of tell us how they feel. So first we have Vivian De Leon. She is an eighth grade student. So Vivian, um, please explain to the board the student's role on the PBIS committee. I think that students being on the PBIS team will be beneficial both ways to students and teachers. For one, it helps teachers see a different point of view and helps them understand where students are coming from. Um, and as for the students, it gives them a sense of comfort to know that their opinions are valid and their reasonings for acting up are valid. As a student representative of PVIS, my goal is to help teachers be more understanding towards students who need help with their behavior. I want them to see that by yelling and demanding, it, is, it isn't always the best way to help them. Teachers are supposed to be helpers and life mentors and by yelling at their students, it influences them to handle things with anger and frustration instead of trying to work it out. Thank you, Vivian. We also have Atlanta Scott, who is also an eighth grade student. So Atlanta, if you can unmute. Um, Atlanta, explain yeah. why it is so important that teachers reward students for positive behavior. Uh, well. If kids are being disrespectful and disobedient, they do not deserve anything. That's how our restrooms and more things are getting messed up. Kids that's respectful and following the rules and being obedient and treating others the way they want to be treated, they deserve something good even when no one is looking. Thank you, Atlanta. Um, our next student is Eric Ramirez. Um, Eric Ramirez, if you could please unmute. Um, so PBIS is all about building relationships. How important is your relationship with your teachers to your success? Me personally, uh, my relationship with my teachers is very important. And to add on to what Vivian said, or just to support what Vivian said, if we criticize students and just constantly bring them down, they're not gonna want to have a good relationship or even have a good relationship with their teachers leading to a worse learning experience. And that is why we need to, we need to introduce to teachers how positive reinforcement and just positive praise rewards both parties as it gives teachers better feedback from the students and the students feel more rewarded from the teachers. Thank you, Eric. Um, our next student is Mia Oberlander, and she is the only seventh grade student on our panel tonight, but uh, so she's going to represent the seventh grade team. But Mia, if you could unmute yourself, what is the most exciting thing about PBIS? I think that the most exciting thing about PBIS is that I get to help other students that are having a hard time or having a hard time behaving. And so we could stop the behaviors early before they do anything worse. I also think it's exciting because I get to be on a team with all the different teachers and staff and all the other students. Thank you, Mia. And our final student is Miss Melody Sen. She is an eighth grader. And Melody, if you can unmute, why should we continue to grow with PBIS? Whenever a child does something wrong, most adults will react by saying the phrases, 
Why did you do that? What is wrong with you? It's your fault. PBIS's goal is to make teacher and student interaction smoother and more enjoyable. When a child makes a mistake, it is not your job to blame them, but more importantly, why they did it and to reteach expected behaviors. Most of the time, a child is looking for support or attention. Therefore, whether it's teacher-student relationships, having fun, or creating a positive, positive environment for others, you'll bet that PBIS will always be there to help. Thank you. So as you guys can see, we, these uh, students have been crucial in kind of influencing us in figuring out what it is that we need to do for our school. And if this is a program about kids, then it's super important that we include them and that we give them a voice as well. Thank you. And so I'm Deanne Sharada, and I'm one of the other counselors here at Oak. And we wanted to share with you some uh, work that we're currently doing to bring a calming environment for students. We call it the Royal Den. Um, the picture that I have on the slide is not our actual Royal Den, but it is a prototype of what we are looking to create. This year, we applied for and received a grant from the Temple City Schools Foundation as startup. And what we wanted to do was create a social emotional learning place for students and a room where we could create a calm environment. So some of the things that we would like to do with this room, this will be a classroom that will be converted into what we will call the Royal Den for Oak. It will be a stress relief center. It will have re relaxation activities like puzzles and painting and things that students can sit and create, uh, coloring books, rock painting, journaling. It'll have some self-help and information about anxiety and other mental health brochures for students. It will be available ideally before lunch, or I mean before school, during lunchtime or after school. It'll be a location that students can come and learn about physical health, mental health, and there'll be other supports there for them as well. We would like to use it for some of our after school classes, including the Promoting Success and other small groups. We are discussing the potential for silent reading workshops during silent reading, where we would take, for example, maybe three days that students would sign up in small groups for specific workshops. So we survey the students at the beginning of the year and based on those needs surveys, we may provide short-term workshops on relationships, um, peer mediation, anger management, anxiety, and so on. Um, we also could use it for PBIS interventions. So when we did wanna have meetings or we wanted to have peer mediations, we'd be able to use the room for that as well. Um, so. Um, our next slide. Um, we also wanna make sure that we're keeping everything current. So we'll be looking at data that will drive the different supports that we have available in the Royal Den. So some of the data that we will be using to evaluate will include the student surveys, as I mentioned, the district health and wellness surveys when those begin again. We'll be looking at suspension data, other discipline data. Um, are there any things that are trending that we see at the school that perhaps we could address with some of our workshops? We'll look at grades, attendance, um, some of the behavior, as I mentioned, counseling data, and then community concerns. So for example, right now, uh, we have a lot of anxiety around COVID and around staying healthy. So there, this would be an area that we would take a look at with regard to student wellness. Um, we also want to have a student advisory committee. This would be a small group of students that would represent various ethnicities, gender concerns, academics, English learners, and others that will keep the DEN student centered. And we wanna thank uh, publicly the Temple City Schools Foundation for giving us the startup for this. And so we're really looking forward to be able to bring more information to you at a later date. Thank you so much. We are so lucky to have such an awesome team, as you can see. I could not be prouder of the students. Um, as Melody was talking, part of some of the new interventions that we're looking at is we're reteaching because sometimes a student 
acts a way that they do because they do not know a different way of being or they don't recognize maybe the tone or something. And really that reteaching and, and that taking time to explain makes a difference. Um, as Eric put it, the relationships, that, that's what matters. And so if a student doesn't feel cared about, well, then they're going to continue to act out. But if they feel cared about, then they're going to want to succeed in this environment because it's enriching. Um, as Atlanta pointed out, it's really important also to reward those students that are doing right, even when they think no one's looking, because oftentimes we are looking. And so being able to catch all those kids, the quiet ones, the, the kind ones, um, this is a great way to sort of celebrate everything that's right at Oak and throughout our district. And then as um, Mia sort of shared, the school really is, it's an important place for our students to have a voice. And that's why we really wanted to include them. So you see here the room, this is the um, character camp room, the one in the corner there with the bikes. And then you see the um, uh, cupboard there that is vacant. It's going to be filled with quotes that some students are going to be putting, things of inspiration. That was actually one of the ideas that some of the students had that, you know, they said as a kid's looking around, they can kind of see something that's maybe motivational. Sometimes when it comes to reteaching, um, things like even good old-fashioned picture books can help a student understand someone else's culture or possibly just someone else's perspective. We have some beautiful slides that were helped, that we created with a, the help of an intern on things from uh, tardiness to cyberbullying. Um, and in this character, when I do character camps, that is one of the many ways that we sort of help re-educate. And that is one of the many interventions that we use. Also, of course, restorative practices. Um, when a student possibly does something that um, they recognize, wow, I made a bad choice. We want to allow for that bridge back to making it so that they realize, okay, so how are you going to help fill that person's bucket again and make it right? Um, you graffitied, now you're helping the custodian with cleaning and helping give back some of that time. But with all of this, clear expectations really matter. And as Vivian sort of shared, having us as a staff be role models, having these amazing students be role models is going to continue to kind of help and um, help everyone thrive at Oak. So we're excited. All right, so again, thank you so much. I think as, as I said at the beginning, I think it's evident now why when I say I'm the, the proud principal of Oak Avenue, when you hear these students speak, um, it just, you know, it, it brings a feeling and seeing what good they're going to be doing and, and seeing them take off like this has just been a, a such a rewarding experience and I'm so proud of them. Um, so again, thank you everybody. I want to thank again, executive cabinet and board for giving us this opportunity to present. Um, we're really excited to get this going and we'll continually keep you updated as we go step-by-step step. and, you know, we're going to roll out P by S slowly, intentionally, uh, and make sure that we get into a footing where we can really look at. Um, how we can affect our community in a positive manner and our school in a positive manner. So thank you so much. Thank you for that wonderful presentation. Um, the Oak team, you guys are fabulous. Um, does anybody have um, questions for the Oak team? I add one last thing, a uh, shout out to Kiana Lee, who um, actually introduced to Oak the five-star program. So she went over and was an awesome ASB leader over at the high school and called back and said, hey, this is a great program that Oak should adopt. So thank you to Kiana too. Yeah, and I'm just my notes, I kind of just bulleted some things that just sparked um, some inspiration for me. Um, one is building relationships because, you know, that is something you do throughout your entire life. So learning early how to build relationships at school and when you get a job and all of that, it's super, super important. It takes you very far if you can master that skill. So that's great. And then the student involvement piece, wonderful. I think that's, you guys are right on with the fact that, you know, the students should be involved at this age, especially, um, and then just, um, you know, definitely thank you to the foundation for their help in your program. 
All right. Well, thank you so much. We will move on now to item number 13, which is public comment on agendized and non-agendized items. Um, and I believe we, yes. do we have any public comment, Marie? No, we don't, Melissa. Okay. All right, great. Moving on then, we will move to item number 14, which is community update by the board president. All right, so um, I have a couple items, a few items here. First, um, the city is looking for volunteers for the 2022 homeless count in Temple City. It looks like it was postponed to February 22nd. There's, some, uh, there's an online sign up for volunteers um, it's a volunteer opportunity um, on the city's website is the sign up. It looks like you do need to be 18 years or, or older to participate in that. Um, secondly, we have the Camellia Festival, which has been postponed to May 20th through the 22nd. And this will may allow for more time to apply for Royal Court and booths, et cetera, I believe. And Mary, you can keep me honest here if that's true. Um, or I'll, I'll be, yes, yes, right. Okay. Um, so I encourage folks to check out their website. It's www.camelliafestival.org. Um, I also want to share that the Lunar New Year celebration that was planned at Temple City Park and Recreation is being canceled due to COVID, according to their website. Um, and um, I, I don't know if there's some other, well, they, I heard um, that they're, they did not have time to plan a virtual celebration. So I'm sure that um, we will, I wanna wish our community a wonderful Lunar New Year. Um, but I also wanted just to share that, you know, if there's any other events that you know of, please um, board members, let me know. Um, the, there is also a blood drive on Monday at the district office. And then we have a huge need for knowing where you can get testing, COVID-19 testing and vaccine. Um, and so I have a few things here that I want to share in terms of dates and times. Um, Tuesdays and Thursdays, we have testing at the district office for staff and students from 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. No appointment is needed. Um, the district has also added two additional Saturday testing events. Uh, one was this past Saturday and the other is this upcoming Saturday on January 29th from eight to 12 p.m. It's open to staff, students and Temple City residents and no appointment is needed at the district office. And then we've got the LA County Sheriff's Department Community Advisor Council is hosting COVID walk-up testing on Thursday from 8 a.m to 4 p.m. at Temple City Park and no appointment is needed for that either. I think I caught them all. Kim, let me know if I've missed something. Okay, with that, we will move on to district updates starting with business services, Connie. Yes, uh, good evening, Board of President, Mrs. Espinosa, Board of Education. The district has submitted the CareShape funding application. CareShape program is formerly also called AB8041. This is a program providing funding for HVAC and the plumbing upgrades, repairs across the California schools. The deadline of the application is the end of this month. The district consultant coming, assisting us for the application without any charges at this time. Last week, as we all know, that San Gabriel Valley experienced heavy wind. A neighbor district occurred various damage as a result of windstorm. Luckily, in our district, we have not aware of any such damage. So we will co continue to close monitor, monitor just in case it's come out later on. The district has sent out a request for proposal for the architect service. We're in the process um, um, of final stage and the service agreement will be submitted for the board approval at the next board meeting. Last Friday, the board and the cabinet attended the governor's proposal for the 2022-23 20, 
state budget and K-12 education, a virtual webinar hosted by School Service of California. The budget assumption in the governor's proposal will be used for the preparation of the district's second intern report, as well as other legal required reports and documentation. That end my report. Thank you. Thank you, Connie. Next, we have educational services. Chris Holmes. Hi, good evening, everybody. Um, thank you, President Espinosa and the school board for uh, everything that you're doing to support us through these challenging times and supporting our students. I was really impressed with that PBIS presentation by Oak. Um, and all the work that's been going on across our district in PBIS and supporting positive student behavior. So in educational services, we have a few updates. Um, with our uh, PLCs, our professional learning community training that's been going on at our secondary schools, um, we have another set of trainings for members of our, our teachers and staff uh, at both the high school and at Oak next week. And that will round out our training and meeting sessions with the Solution Tree um, training consultant that we'll be working with this year and next year. And then we will pick back up next year uh, with that consultant uh, to continue moving forward in this area. We will be working as teams um, on developing our process with PLCs. And we're very confident that this process is going to only work to improve uh, student outcomes in all areas, not just academics, but in the uh, social emotional learn wellness of our students and the relationship building amongst staff and between staff and students. So we're really excited about that. Um, we're also concurrently working with our math adoption with sixth through 10th grade. And um, Amy Gerling and Scott Sherman are doing uh, most of the Yemen's work in that area. And we're very proud and impressed with the work being put in by our teachers. Um, they're going to be finishing up the first uh, curriculum from HMH here in the next few weeks and then moving on to the Carnegie curriculum, which is the other curriculum that we're looking at. We're, we're going through the pilot, excuse me. And then at the end of the pilot, our teachers will evaluate the curriculum and decide which to recommend that they would recommend for adoption. So it's going well and there's a lot of good work going on in that program. Um, the first semester ended last week at uh, our high school and the second quarter ended last week at Oak. So our teachers have been working very hard to support our students in completing their finals and getting those grades in for first semester. And as everybody is well aware, um, this is the time of year our students start submitting and finalizing their college applications. So there's just a lot going on in the area of ed services. And I just wanna thank everybody in the educational services team for all of their hard work, especially during this time of year. Thank you, Christopher Holmes. Next, we've got Dr. Tamar Katarayan for Human Resources. Thank you, President Espinoza and good evening, Board of Education. Um, I would like to start by extending my condolences to all of those who were impacted by the loss of our kids. Um, this was a tragedy felt amongst our entire TCUSD family. So my condolences to everybody. Um, next up, we are, um, it's, it's yet another busy time for human resources. We are sending out our intent to return forms earlier than normal this year. Those will be going out the week of February 7th. Um, this is just for hopes of us to get our staffing numbers um, as tight as possible and as early as possible. So those will be going out on February 7th. Um, in addition, that same week, we are looking to send out our Teacher of the Year nominations, as well as our Classified Employee of the Year nominations. We're also doing this early. We want to make sure we're meeting all the deadlines and we have um, everything ready to go. So um, that will be sent out the week of February 7th. Um, round two of negotiations is underway. Tomorrow is round two with TCEA Union and the following week with um, CSEA 105 and 823. Um, and last but not least, we are updating our seniority lists, and those will be going out to our union leaders fairly quickly. And that is it for Human Resources. Thank you so much. We'll move on to student services slash student discipline update. Christopher Holmes, you're up again. I'm back. Okay. Um, uh, first, uh, 
as we know coming up, and I know Dr. Fricker will talk about this in a few minutes, but February 7th through 11th is National School Counseling Week. And uh, in student services, I have the pleasure and honor of working with our counselors. Um, and they are an amazing team in our district doing just wonderful work. Um, and so I just wanna personally thank each and every one of our counselors in our district for always putting kids first and always prioritizing the safety, well-being, and the needs of our students. Um, TCUSD is known for having a dedicated and compassionate and caring team of counselors. Um, uh, next, we will be presenting to the board this evening our uh, school accountability report cards. And that's the annual report that each of our schools complete and submit. And then we as a district submit them to the CDE and they'll be on our school website and on the CDE website for review from our community members so they can see what we are doing and what's going on at our schools. Um, there are a number of areas that are covered in the report card and it's a very important concise piece of information uh, for our students and their families to be able to access wanting to see all the great work that's happening at our schools. Um, student behavioral incidents have really decreased since we've returned from Christmas break. I think that a lot of the challenges that we experienced coming back from COVID closure uh, were expected and, and some of the particular incidents were a little bit disappointing, but not necessarily unexpected. But each of our school sites and the teams there, the counseling teams, the teachers, and the administrators there have really done a good job, not only in responding to those incidents, but also coming up with plans to help support our students in becoming better acclimated and in demonstrating improved behavior. And so I've spoken with each of the principals and they have commented on how through the efforts of their teachers and the efforts of their counselors and staff members that um, after, especially after returning from the holidays, we've seen a marked improvement in student behavior. And, and I think in, if anything, that goes to show you just what great students we have in our district and um, how responsive they are to interventions and supports. And finally, the winter sports season at the high school is coming to a close in a couple of weeks. And so I do invite all of our board members and our community members if they haven't had the opportunity to get out and see our teams on the field. Three of our teams are currently in first place in league and all five of our teams or, or at least five of our teams, excuse me, are vying for the opportunity to participate, participate in playoffs. So we are very, very uh, proud of the efforts of our student athletes, especially during this challenging time to still get out there and show the discipline and commitment. It's just so impressive. And then I uh, had the opportunity to read the student newspaper at Oak Middle School. And as a former college writer and editor, I just wanted to say how impressed I am with the journalism program at the middle school and the journalists and their writing at Oak. And that's all I have from student services. Great, thank you so much. And we have next educational technology, Susan Hemmins. Good evening, everyone. I'm glad to be here tonight. Um, first, I just want to say that the Virtual Academy has survived and thrived in its first completed semester. So that was an accomplishment in itself. Um, and just special thanks to everyone who supported this from teachers, staff, parents. I mean, it was endless the number of people who had um, their finger in it somewhere to help make it successful because there were, there were several bumps along the way. Um, but I think we're doing a good job and I'm glad that we were able to offer our community an option. I feel that's super important and that's hoping that's something that we can continue in the years to come. Um, our enrollment is staying steady even with the change um, in semesters. As of this afternoon, we have 112 students in secondary. So that's up like one student from um, the last meeting. We, we had about 13 return to their home schools, whether Oak or the high school, and but 14 coming over. And the biggest group of that coming over has actually been seniors. Um, maybe it's, um, we're gonna try and do some surveys to try and get some ideas why some of it is. I think they've figured out what they wanna do with college in their next steps so they know what they need to do. Um, I think some of them have just decided, you know, 
this is this is a good way to go. So it'll be interesting to see how that um, changes. And then elementary, we had some go back a couple of weeks ago when uh, we returned, and then we've had a few come back due to Omicron and parents still concerned um, about the health and welfare of their kids and, and their extended families. So we are at about 339. So our total in the virtual academy is 451. So again, um, it's been pretty consistent after the very beginning of the year when we had some really high numbers and it's, it's kind of settled out. So um, that's been very positive. Um, in the bigger world, our tech committee has released a couple of surveys this past week um, at the elementary level and at the secondary level to ask teachers about their usage of Canvas, our, our learning management system, and to see where we want to move forward with it for next year. In other words, what kind of parameters do we want to set at the different grade levels? Because the usage, when we look at, you know, K-1 is very different than what we would look at the usage at middle school and then on into high school. So as we get those surveys back, we'll, we'll start to set those parameters. And then the next step um, with the committee, we will be looking at our software usage. Uh, we purchased a, a variety of platforms to use uh, when we went out in distance learning. And so now it's time to determine which ones are being used um, the most, um, you can use the most into the best possible um, learning and teaching for our for our kids, and then um, so we're going to be doing a uh, usability report, running it. And I've got the uh, tech guys working working on that with me, so that we can um, establish some just kind of overall view of what's really happening, and so we know how best to spend um, to spend our money. So that pretty much wraps it up for tech. Thank you, Susan. Okay, we will move on to item number 16, bargaining unit comments, TCEA. Kyla, do you have anything for us tonight? Uh, no, you know, I, I think I just uh, just mentioned, I know that our teachers um, have been having a, a really challenging time just with the, the Omicron uh, rise. Um, it's been difficult on schools. I mean, I think everyone's been doing a, a good job, but it's been really challenging. Um, there's been, you know, needs for subs and we've just had a lot of sick sick uh, teachers and, um, and a lot of students that have been out as, as well. So I just wanna recognize that it's a, a, taking a very large toll. Um, it is making people that are already burnt out feel more burnt out. And I see all the amazing things and I love the presentations of the, the awesome and cool things that um, our, all of our employees in the district are still doing. But I just really wanna recognize that it's, we all put on a very brave face and a very happy face and we are here happy to serve, but it, it is definitely taking its toll. So um, I just want to add that in so that we, we recognize that as much as the good work is good work, um, it does come at a cost. So thank you. That definitely is heard. Thank you. Um, we'll move on to CSEA 105. Welcome, Tessie. Ridley, do you have anything for us tonight? Yeah, thank you, Melissa. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm going to echo um, Kyla's words in that it was a very, very, very rough start um, back after winter break. Um, you know, I know we were running around in the front office and, and the nurses were running around and all our classified staff were pulled in every which direction as well. And, you know, reaching 20% absenteeism with the kids, it's just, it's, it's a lot. It's a lot to track. It's a lot to take care of. It's a lot it's just a lot of paperwork, a lot of paper trails and a lot of follow up. Um, but we, um, we appreciate that. And like Kyla said, it doesn't come at, um, it doesn't come free. It's there's, there's a lot of people out there that are feeling like they're just not appreciated. And I know that they are, but it's, it's, it's felt, it's felt that, um, it's hard, you know, it's harder the work, the more we're giving, and, you know, some people are feeling even less appreciated, but you know, hopefully things will slow down and we'll get back on track. So that's really it. All right. Thank you. Definitely Thank heard. You. Thank you. We're hearing it. All right. CSCA 823. Art. Hi, good evening, everybody. Uh, I just want to touch on the same. Yeah. When we came back after the break, it wasn't good. We have 
people that are out got sick um having to sit, stay home for a good five to ten days um that takes a toll out of people a lot of a few of my members had to suffer that um but i'm glad they're okay you know this this they were vaccinated and um it didn't hit them hard um so that's a good thing uh but yeah you know we're we're scrambling you know we're trying to keep our schools as safe as possible and as sanitized as possible but we're running on fumes and you know it's hard when we're when we're doing what we do what we do but it's hard when we don't have that manpower to do so other than that um um i want to thank the board and the district for coming to an agreement on the juneteenth issue um the holiday we signed an mou and i'm glad that got done I'm glad they didn't have to go any farther than it should have. Um, and also want to thank the district on the Summer Saver program. Um, that program will help my 10 month and my part time people out a lot for the summer, their summer expenses. So, again, thank you very much for that. Hopefully they take advantage of this program and, and use it for, for their better good. Um, and also, I'm looking forward into the negotiations. Uh, I know we've been off for about a month. I was hoping we were going to get some more um, time in to kind of finalize all this so we could start working on our next successor negotiation. But I am looking forward to next week meeting with the district and hopefully finalizing everything else we have on the table. Um, other than that, um, that's all I have. I hope everybody stays safe. and. Um, be well. Thank you, Art. With that, we will move on to item number 17, which is board member comments. And tonight we will start with uh, member Giorgino. You're muted, Donna. Okay. Thanks, Matt. <laughs> it's been a while since we've had a regular meeting, so. Uh, there's been a lot going on. Um, first, I want to thank Oak Avenue for their presentation on PBIS. Um, with students like Eric, Vivian, Atlanta, Mia, and Melody, I'm confident that there's going to be great things happening at Oak, and I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I attended the holiday concert uh, that was held at Temple City High School, and I loved it. Um, it was great to see the students performing in person, and I'm looking forward to uh, more opportunities to see them perform in person. They were great, uh, despite the fact that they've had really challenging times uh, uh, practicing. We've had two superintendents forums and I wanna uh, thank our staff that they did an excellent job on both of them. Um, I think they're a great way to communicate with the public and also um, one of the best things about it is it allows the viewers to ask questions in real time. So I think that's really valuable. Um, I had an idea, I don't know, maybe Kim might be able to do this in the future if we had a superintendent's forum on the preschool, because I know there's a lot of excitement and interest, and, and, but people have lots of questions. So that might be something for the future. Time out. <coughs> um, I watched, uh, <coughs> excuse me, two of the governor's budget workshops. One was by school services and the other one was uh, LACO and capital advisors. I did both of them because the school budgets are so complicated. I really want to try to um, understand them. Uh, they were described, they described the governor's budget as uh, the people who were doing the presentation as they were pleased, but not overjoyed. Um, so far, one of the highlights is a 5.33 COLA, but there is no relief for PERS and STRS, which um, there will be a, an, ex an increase in the coming year. So that kind of uh, wipes away some of the COLA, but we'll see what happens in May um, when the governor comes out with his revised budget. I wanna congratulate the Science Olympiad team at uh, Temple City High School. Uh, they competed in the Caltech National Invitational. They came in 13th place. Um, so they are in the top 5% nationally. 
Uh, they came in first place in four of 17 events, which is really amazing. Uh, so kudos to Kylie Bell and Ryan Wong, who are the student uh, leaders. And thank you to Kevin Slattery, who um, assists the club. I uh, viewed two Student of the Month presentations, one for December and one for January. It's one of my uh, favorite activities each month because we get to hear about all the great things our students have achieved. Um, last night, uh, one of the young men was talking about a program at Temple City High School, and I can't remember the name of it, maybe one of my colleagues remembers, but it's where the students um, assist other students who are in special ed um, in being uh, included in school activities. And it sounded like a really interesting program, and maybe Keanu will tell us a little bit about it. Um, but uh, it sounded like a great program. And so I'd like to hear more about that. And finally, I watched the TED-Ed Showcase from La Rosa. Um, that's one of my favorite activities each year too. The children were so inspiring. Um, they're so thoughtful and insightful and articulate. Um, kudos to uh, Cindy Young, the, the teacher at Oak, uh, not Oak, at La Rosa, who, um, heads up this program. She had a large group. I didn't count how many students there were, but they just kept coming and coming and coming. So she's worked with a large group this year. And she's also worked, uh, they've been working hybrid. So some of the kids are at home and some of them are at school. So she's really doing a great job as she has in past years. And I want to thank her for that. That is all I have. Thank you, Melissa. All right, thank you, Member Giorgino. Next up, we've got Member Lynn. Dr. Lynn. Thank you, Board President Espinoza. It is with a heavy heart that I would like to start my remarks by expressing my condolences to the families of our three students, Andon, Eric, and Nicholas. We are deeply affected and heartbroken and no words can really ease the pain of our three families the students and the staff of the Learning Center and the TCUSD community. Uh, we are grateful for the surge in the support provided by our counseling team. Um, thank you to our counselors for providing crisis counseling and promoting mental wellness uh, to our students in the wake of this tragedy and um, providing outstanding counseling support consistently for many years. Um, I will also like to acknowledge and express my appreciation for the dedication and diligence of our teachers, staff, and administration during the Omicron surge, uh, the shortages in staff, and uh, going the extra mile in providing coverage so schools can remain open. Um, we see you and we appreciate you. I would also like to thank the special presenters this evening. Uh, thank you to the excellent presentation about Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, kudos also to Oak Intermediate School's PBIS and Character Camp. And thank you for uh, your highlights. Uh, it was especially inspiring to hear our Oak PBIS student committee representatives relate to the virtues of compassion, integrity, and responsibility in their own words. And finally, I would like to wish our TCUSD families who celebrate the Lunar New Year a safe and happy Year of the Tiger. Thank you, take good care of yourself, stay safe, stay healthy, and that is all for me. All right, thank you, Dr. Lynn. Uh, next up, we have Member Smith. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm not sure that I'm going to add anything new, but uh, I, I did attend a lot of the events that others have already addressed. The holiday concert in December, enjoyed that very much. I uh, also had a chance to participate in the superintendent's forum in early January. And I didn't realize at the time, you couldn't tell by looking, but there were, Kim told me later, over 400 people who were on that, um, that forum. So that's a great uh, turnout. Uh, like uh, Donna in particular, I attended uh, several different um, budget Forums, the CSBA Governor's Budget Breakdown webinar on the 11th, LACO Budget Workshop on the 18th, and the um, uh, School Services California Governor's Budget Workshop on the 21st. And I attended all three of those too because you want to get the, the understanding as best you can. 
And I will say uh, the one, I don't remember who said it, but they, they kind of said that to, to sum up uh, this year's budget in just three words, it's, they said it's sort of a stay the course year. There's nothing really new in the way of programs, not particularly a lot of money being allocated to different things, but um, more of the same. So anyway, that's good. Um, let's see, I did have a chance also to attend the TED-Ed uh, Zoom meeting uh, a week or half, week and a half or so ago and uh, uh, enjoyed that as well. Um, I also had a chance to attend the Kiwanis Student of the Month uh, presentation last night. And uh, I uh, wanted to uh, also recognize the presenters tonight for the MLK presentation and certainly Oak Avenue and PBIS and what they're doing there. Um, all of us got a um, email about 10 days ago from uh, Christopher Rios. And when I got that, I thought it was a, since the CSBA conference back in uh, December, I get six to eight vendor emails a week trying to pitch something. But I, I assumed that was the same thing. And I didn't really look at it good and hard until yesterday. And I realized that Christopher Rios is a student at uh, Temple City High School. And what he was uh, trying to share with us was his thoughts and opinions about where to go with technology for the district, uh, specifically uh, encouraging us to look, explore uh, Linux and um, um, open source software. And he has a, had a presentation he developed for the, both the board and then for the technology committee. And I, I passed that along to Kim uh, earlier this afternoon. And the one thing I wanted to say is I, uh, for those of us who were able to attend the CSBA conference in December, the second keynote was actually not an individual, but a group of former um, student board members uh, from previous years. And they um, shared with us their thoughts and things they would like to see more of and different. And one of them was to participate in district decisions that affect them directly. So here's, here's I just, as I read Christopher's presentations and looked at them, I thought, well, here's an opportunity for maybe for that to happen. And I was pleased, Susan, when you talked about earlier today or this evening, sending out the surveys and getting input and whatnot. So I think that's all good stuff. Uh, and then uh, lastly, uh, well, not lastly, but uh, I'd like to thank the 61 people who, and organizations who donated $11,680 uh, in our uh, but, uh, agenda tonight. And then uh, like the other board members, I would like to share my condolences for the unfortunate situation that occurred last week or so with uh, Aiden, Eric, and Nicholas. And it's uh, very sad to see that kind of thing happen. Anyway, that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Member Smith. And next up is Member Sneed. Okay. Uh, thank you, President Espinoza. Um, I also want to send my condolences to the families of Aiden, Eric, and Nicholas. Um, I can't even comprehend the pain that their families are feeling right now. Um, I hope they know that they have the entire Temple City Unified community supporting them. And my prayers are with the families and also uh, their, the fellow students um, of these three young men uh, who, are, who came back to school feeling a very deep loss. I um, want to acknowledge also the, um, the High School Science Olympia team. Um, Donna mentioned how they placed I want to acknowledge their captains, the seniors, uh, Ryan Wong and Kylie Bell, uh, fellow seniors, Jenny uh, Chen and Alicia Liu, juniors, Phoenix He, Joshua Su, Jackie Lee, sophomores, Ted Hong, Ethan Lee, Phoebe Lee, Tatiana Liang, Kehlani, Kehlana Peng, I hope I'm getting these names right. Ellen Tang and Haley Tang. And we also had some freshmen on the team, Tiffany Fan, Lauren Tan, and Issa Wu. Um, and congratulations to Kevin Slattery, Slattery who, uh, who was their advisor. And just, uh, you've all made us very proud. Um, congratulations to uh, Mrs. Young again for um, working with the students on their TED Ed presentations. Uh, it's a great program that she's been uh, spearheading for years and it's just amazing to listen to these students sharing their thoughts. Um, I also viewed the, uh, the governor's budget workshop um, 
while, as Matt said, it looks like a continuation of the past, it's going to see, be interesting to see how his, uh, the governor's proposals work out in the long run. Um, one message that I kept hearing though, is that at least education is valued, which is good to hear from people in that position. Uh, thank you to um, uh, Principal Lesson and Oak Avenue for your presentation. And also um, Mr. Holmes, thank you for arranging the uh, presentation on Martin Luther King. I always, I'm like Donna, I always enjoy hearing uh, about programs at, the, at our schools. And uh, I'm very impressed by the students who were involved in the PBIS program at Oak. It's good to see them involved. And also with the counseling staff, um, thank you for everything you're doing, especially this year. It's been a hard year and um, they've done a bang up job uh, helping on a lot of the mental, it, a lot of the issues that have sprung up. I really wanna thank our school staffs for handling our frontline work. Um, I know how stressful these last weeks have been. Um, and I truly, truly appreciate you and all the important work you're doing for our schools. We, I, I, we hear you, we understand how hard this has been and we appreciate you still putting in, in the effort. Um, I wanna, I'd like to recognize our community partnerships that have allowed us to sponsor both some vaccination um, and testing sites. Uh, they've allowed us to expand this testing days and they were actually able to uh, add another vaccination clinic last Saturday at Longdon. Um, one of the uh, partnerships was with Harold Christian Healthcare and Mari Montgomery uh, has been working tirelessly to with to get these partnerships working. Um, thank you also to Kiwana for recognizing our students. Uh, last night I attended the Temple City Committee on Aging meeting. I actually fit in real well since I am a senior. Um, future uh, plans that they're working on are opportunities to have our students interact with seniors in our community, which I think is a great, um, great opportunity from both the senior citizen standpoint and our student standpoint. Um, a happy Lunar New Year to our families who are celebrating that in a week or so. And um, lastly, yes, the Camellia Festival has been postponed for the first time in 78 years. Uh, it will be the weekend of May 20th to the 22nd. Uh, it's going to look a little different this year. Um, I'm the float chairman and I encourage anybody who feels like they want to decorate something like a wagon, a bike or whatever, um, they can create their own float using whatever they want and they can be part of the parade. So um, all they have to do is go to the website and fill out an application and you can be a part of the uh, Kamea Parade this year. So thank you. Thank you, Member Sneed. All right, I will round out the comments from the board with some um, comments. Um, I, I think that, um, you know, I'm hoping everyone had a restful and winter and healthy winter break, um, but we kind of kicked off the year pretty rough, um, coming back to a surge, coming back to a tragedy, um, and, you know, the work that goes behind trying to support everything that's going on is just unbelievable. So um, it's a tough time to be working in education across the board. And, you know, we just want to make sure that staff, administrators, um, classified staff, certificated staff, and everybody that's involved in making our school run um, that you're appreciated. And, um, Yes, that's, I, I, that's what I wanna say about that. Um, I also wanna recognize MLK Day that was on January 17th. Um, I think Dr. King's activism and tireless leadership in, civil right, in the civil rights movement, um, his legacy is still critical today, um, just as critical as it was back um, in the 50s and the 60s. So. Um, thank you for that presentation today. Um, I also want to wish everyone in advance a happy Lunar New Year on February 1st. 
year of the tiger, wishing everyone health, strength, and prosperity in this lunar new year. Um, as far as attendance, since our last holiday concert, since our last meeting, I went to the holiday concert, Lights on Temple City. I attended all three budget webinars, and I kind of agree with all of those comments about the budget. Um, I want to thank all the donors who donated this, this period that we're reporting today. Um, I also attended the Kiwanis Student of the Month recognition, and I want to take this opportunity to thank the Kiwanis Club for recognizing our students and for making it so special. Um, I, I didn't get to say that last night when I made a comment at the end, and I, I want to make sure that I, I get that um, out there for that message out there for Kiwanis. Um, and then congratulations to Science Olympiad. Super proud out of your outstanding accomplishments and keep up the great work. Um, and I think that is everything. So next we will go on to item number 18, student board member comments. Kiana, what do you have for us? Thank you, President Espinosa. Can you hear me okay? I mm -hmm. can, thank you. Great, thank you. Um, so this past month, um, I, as well as the sophomore class uh, president at the high school, have been working with Dr. Hernandez and Principal Lujan at the high school uh, in the safety committee uh, to revise the comprehensive school safety plan. Um, one, uh, one part of the safety plan that was important to us especially was modernizing the school dress code in terms of equity and logistics. Um, Oak is also, uh, we, I actually got to attend last night's um, Oak PTA meeting and they did note that they're holding their virtual winter pep rally this Friday. So their ASB did get to prepare a video for their students in a virtual format. Uh, due to cur current COVID protocols, um, I'm, I'm sure also at Oak too, but a lot of our TCHS clubs and, uh, and campus groups have not been permitted to meet indoors. They have had to transfer their club meetings to an outdoor format or virtual format. Um, I know a uh, member, um, I'm sorry, we at last night's Kiwanis meeting, uh, I know member um, Giorgino brought up how one of my peers, actually Raymond, he was from the Society of Friends Club, which works with the uh, special needs students. And we're actually, I'm also a part of the club and it's definitely uh, one of my greatest passions. I truly enjoy, um, I truly enjoy working with uh, and getting to engage with them because we do all kinds of fun activities, arts and crafts. We're actually having a meeting tomorrow. Where we're going to do origami. And um, one of, for example, as clubs such as these are now currently having to meet in uh, outdoors or uh, virtually due to the current uh, COVID protocols that our administration has been putting in place. Um, we also learned that the TCUSD has received our, as the state issued COVID rapid antigen test kits. And uh, maybe later on after my comments, and we were just wondering, uh, many students have been asking me throughout this week, um, whether we, uh, the district can enlighten us as to their distribution plan for that, for the antigen tests. And lastly, we did know, I did have several students tell us that they are very appreciative of Ms. Montgomery's um, COVID dashboard on the TCSD website. However, uh, they were wondering if, for example, we could add a, an updated date on the COVID dashboard to indicate to parents that the COVID dashboard has been last updated as of uh, the, the certain date, so they are aware of the um, when it was last updated, just for their transparency between the families and administration. And thank you very much. All right, thank you, Member Lee, Student Board Member Lee. All right, next up, item nineteen, Superintendent's comments, Dr. Fricker. Thank you uh, so much. Um. First and foremost, um, I just want to express that our hearts deeply go out to the families and the students um, and our staff members uh, across our community who have been deeply affected by the loss of our three students at the DDSLC. Um, nothing really prepares you for these times and nothing really replaces um, the loss of students. 
Um, I want to thank just some members of our crisis counseling team who got together in preparation and making sure that counselors were mobilized. I want to thank Mr. Holmes and Mr. Westgate, obviously for their leadership um, through this difficult time. It's very difficult when um, you have a student loss, but to have three um, is, is just tragic. And so we definitely want to make sure that anybody who needs counseling services can get them. Um, our counselors have done an amazing job. We have checked in with them last week and this week um, and making sure that they are, even though they are responding to others' needs, it is very important that the individuals behind that get um, their needs met too. So we wanna make sure that they have equal support. But I echo the comments by the board members um, and everybody who has paid tribute to uh, the families who have definitely lost their dearly beloved children. Um, I wanted to say that we have met, you know, with counselors just to discuss mental health of our students on a whole and what we can do in the district to support their efforts there on the school sites and grounds. It's very important for us to maintain contact uh, with them and keep in touch with, you know, the, the trends that they see uh, in the day to day uh, and working with their student populations. And I want to thank Mr. Holmes for doing a great job at leading the counseling teams and really staying in tune and then alerting to me if there's um, situations that arise that we may need to address and or look at those resources and supports that we provide to our students a little bit differently. So uh, we have, I think Mr. Holmes is going to have the counselors present in February. Uh, so the board has an update on some important data that they would like to share uh, so that we maintain, you know, knowledge and awareness of the things that are happening on our campus. And I love to be proactive in making sure that you know, when we see some of these trends rise, when we see some of these things happen, uh, we know that we need to route in some support to help um, to help mitigate that across our campuses. So that's really important for us to do. We welcome our counseling team in that presentation, hopefully next month. I think at the first boarding me meeting on the 9th, they will be presenting to us um, and giving us some information. Um, with regard to the DS, DIS counselor that we um, intend to hire through the ESSER funds um, and the board, thank, thank you for approving that. Uh, we've had problems filling that position. So our plan is <clears throat> for that to really look outside and have some con uh, consulting um, firms or a contract issued with a consulting firm to have a student uh, a member come in at least for this year until we can fly that position again and hopefully get a full-time person in that position. So um, we look forward to doing that. Um, we've met with uh, Mr. Matt Byers and Mr. Elias Borshigli, uh recently, uh, today in fact, um, to talk about the musical uh, on a positive note, uh, the musical is a shining tradition of Temple City. And so we understand the effects of COVID and, and the really the detraction from, you know, some of those presentations and those programs that we're used to seeing and the performances definitely. Um, and so we want a way to preserve that not only for this year, but try to preserve that in future years. So we are really working in tandem with Matt Byers. I'm glad that he kind of came out to, of retirement and is a consultant with us on this effort. And I know that Elias is stepping up in, in, in order to help us um, make sure that, that the future of the musical is ongoing. So they will be also presenting in February on some options that we can do this year and then maybe future options um, just to keep the board abreast of uh, what we're thinking in terms of the mus musical and then in preparedness um, for ongoing on years on fundraising and then also making sure that, that such a performance can continue to exist. So they will be presenting hopefully to on February 9th. And then uh, this week is um, National Kindness Week. And so I just want to thank all of the principals who have done <laughs> kindness activities, random acts of kindness, and making sure that kindness is a significant portion um, of, of the function of our school. And, and we know that um, when we interact with one another and we share kindness and we have um, selfless acts uh, that we give, it really can change someone's day. Uh, we may not know all of the things that are involved in that person's day, what they're struggling with, um, what they've had to deal with, what they're overcoming, but the smallest amounts of kindness make the biggest amounts of difference. And so in the words of Judy Call, uh, everyone knows that she's beloved member of our staff that she always says that kindness is a superpower. And it really is. And so, you know, this week, 
COVID has been challenging and, um, you know, the, the things that we tackle in a given week are challenging. And I have to say last night, I was just going through my email and I ran across from that day. I ran across, um, several emails from some emperor students, just wishing me well, and, you know, just affirming, you know, messages that, that gave me the biggest boost last night. It was probably the most effective medicine I could ever have. I am extremely grateful to the point of tears and I cannot thank whomever uh, I won't mention the teacher's name, but I cannot thank the teachers who, you know, encourage their students just to send an email to some of our administrators across the district and just wishing us well. So thank you very much. Kindness does matter. And on that note, I will turn it back over to you. Okay. Thank you. For your words, Dr. Fricker, we'll move on to item number 20, written communications. I do have a couple of communications. I will say that um, Los Angeles County Office of Education sent a letter on January 19th um, to uh, address to member Smith as board president, and then they revised the letter. So I'm going, they, and sent it January 26th today. So I'm going to read the revised letter, not the um, original letter, is if that's okay with the board members. <laughs> okay, so January 26th um, from Los Angeles County Office of Education, otherwise known as LACO. Dear Ms. Espinoza, pursuant to Education Code Section 42131, the Los Angeles County Superintendent of Schools, County Superintendent, has completed our review of the Temple City Unified School District's 2021-22 first interim report. Our analysis of the data provides indication, provided indicates that the district may not meet its financial obligation for the 2023-24 fiscal year. We therefore concur with the district's qualified certification and offer our comments and concerns below. Deficit, and then there's a heading, deficit spending and reserve for economic uncertainties. The district is projecting an operated deficit of 2.62 million, representing 4.93% of the district's unrestricted general fund projected expenditures and other outgo for physical, I'm sorry, for fiscal year 2021-22. The district is also projecting operating deficit of 9.79 million and 10.08 million for 2022-23 and 2023-24, representing 17.31% and 17.74% respectively. According to our review, and as confirmed by the district, the projected deficits are due to a combination of declining enrollment, increases in STRS and PERS, employer contributions, special education contributions, and spending down of one-time federal and state funds and prior year carryover. Due to the deficit spending, the unrestricted general fund is projected to decrease from a beginning balance of 19.09 million in 2021-22 to an ending balance of negative 3.4 million by 2023-24, a decline of approximately 22.49 million or 117.81% over three years, as illustrated in the following chart. Then there's a chart, um, goes on to say, while the reserve of the economic uncertainties for 2021-22 and 22-23 meets the, stat, the state criteria and standards, require, standards required minimum, the uh, REU, which is the Reserve for Economic Uncertainties, for 2023-24 does not meet the required minimum reserve level. The projected shortfall in the district's REU indicate that the district may not meet its financial obligation in 2023-24, which places the district's fiscal solvency in a qualified status. We require the district to submit a board-approved fiscal stabilization plan, an FSP, and identify any necessary budget adjustments to restore and maintain the REU at the required level. The FSP should be submitted with the 2021-22 second interim report due at our office on or before March 17, 2022. 
Heading number two is declining enrollment and reduced state funding. The district's 2021-22 first interim report reflects declining enrollment with projected funded average daily attendance, FADA, of 5,463 for 2021-22, 5,027 for 2022-23, and 4,932 for 2023-24. The estimated impact of the declining enrollment on the district's projected ADA reflects a two-year loss totaling 531 ADA representing a 9.72% decrease from the district's 2021-22 ADA. This rate of projected decline in enrollment represents a loss of revenue for the district in the current in the current and future years. We recommend that the district continue to assess and adjust staffing needs and facility planning for upcoming years based on the projected rate of decline in enrollment. We remind the district that Ed Code Section 42238.5 Section A1 allows districts with declining attendance to continue to receive funding based on the greater of prior year or current year actual attendance. This provides a one-year delay for loss of revenue due to declining enrollment slash attendance. However, the district will continue to lose state funding over time as enrollment declines and it must carefully, it must carefully monitor enrollment trends and adjust its financial projections accordingly for the current and subsequent fiscal years if further material reductions in enrollment occur or are expected to occur. The next heading is labor contract negotiations. According to our review of the district's first interim report, certificated and classified labor contract negotiations for 2021-22 remain unsettled and potential changes have not been calculated and incorporated into projected salary and benefit expenditures. We are concerned that any salary and benefit increases could adversely affect the financial condition of the district. As a reminder, before the district's Board of Education takes any action on proposed collective bargaining agreement, the district must meet the public disclosure requirements of government code section 3547.5 and the California Code of Regulations title five section 15449. The document used for this analysis is included in informational bulletin number 5405 dated July 16, 2021 and is titled 2021-22 Forms for Assembly Bill 1200, Public Disclosure of Proposed Collective Bargaining Agreements. This document can be found at the following website and it's at laco.edu website. Then it goes on to talk about the next heading, Budget Adjustments Required. The district's first interim report projects 2021-22 total expenditures of 83.83 million, which exceeds the current total expenditures budget of 64.34 million, a difference of 19.49 million pursuant to the provisions of Ed Code section 42600. This letter is a reminder that the governing board must approve budget adjustments that grant the necessary board authority for this higher total expenditures projection. And then the next heading is actions required by the district. Due to the district's qualified first interim certification, the district is required to take the following actions. Reevaluate its spending priorities and make board approved adjustments to the 2021-22 budget and multi-year projections that restore and maintain the REU at the required level. Two, next bullet, submit a board approved FSP that addresses deficit spending and delineates the actions the district will undertake to ensure that the district remains fiscally solvent. And third bullet, incorporate any necessary board approved adjustments to the budget and multi-year projections to ensure implementation of the district's FSP in its 2021-22 second interim report and analyze and monitor its enrollment and ADA projections for the current and out years to validate the projections to be used in the second interim report and adjust the multi-year projections accordingly. Each of the above requirements will be a crucial factor in our review review and approval of the district's 2021-22 second interim report 
due to the county superintendent loaded no later than March 17th, 2021. And then the next heading is county office annual report pursuant to the provision of Ed Code Section 1240E under Assembly Bill 8 AB 139, the county superintendent is required to present an annual report to the school district's governing board and the superintendent of public instruction. The annual report must address the fiscal solvency of any school district with a disapproved budget, a qualified or negative interim certification or any fiscal uncertainty as identified in EC 42127.6. This county office report will issue the district prior will be issued to the district prior to the statutory due date. Debt issuance is the next heading. As a reminder of the statutory requirement placed on debt issuance by school districts with the qualified interim report certifications, these requirements are specifically addressed by EC section 42133A and are required in the current and next succeeding fiscal year. Uh, submission of studies, reports, evaluations, and or audits. EC sections 42127 and 42127.6 require districts to submit to the county superintendent any studies, reports, evaluations, or audits completed of the district that contain evidence that the district is showing fiscal distress. They also require the county superintendent to incorporate that information into our analysis of budgets, interim reports, and the district's overall fiscal or financial condition. We remind the district to submit any such documents to this office that are commissioned by the district, e.g. reports completed by the fiscal crisis and management assistance team or by the state superintendent of public instruction and or a state control agency and an internal audit division anytime they are received by the district. Conclusion, thank you for providing documentation that supports the district's qualified certification, the multi-year projections with narrative and assumptions. We, oh, oh the multi-year projections with narrative and assumptions were helpful in our analysis and verifying the district's financial condition. The information provided reflects the district's financial position and assumptions as of October 31st, 2021, and further adjustments will be made during the year as additional data becomes available. We hope these comments are helpful to the district's administration and the board as you plan for the remainder of 2021-22 and develop your projections for 2022-23 and 2023-24. We express our appreciation to the district staff for their cooperation during our review. If our office may be of further assistance, please call Octavio Costello, Director of Business Advisory Services, his phone number is listed, or Meryl Ordonez business services consultant, and then sincerely Patricia Smith, chief financial officer, business services. That was a mouthful. <laughs> Let's go on to the next one. Um, the next um, letter that we received was, um, I'll read it um, from our counseling staff. Distinct, distinguished board members, my name is Nate Slaymaker. I am a TCHS graduate and current school counselor at TCHS. Our school and community was struck with a tragedy this past week in the midst of such an awful experience for our students, families, and school communities. I'm encouraged by how administrators, counselors, teachers, and staff members came together to support our students and their families through such, a difficult, circ through such difficult circumstances. I come to you tonight on behalf of TCHS students and families with information and continuing concern. As far as crisis counseling and management, the tragedy we recently experienced made for a week, a work week in the TCHS counseling office that sadly is not an aberration. Our student body has been dealing with a mental health crisis since August. Crisis counseling has become the norm. The crisis incidents represented in the chart below include suicide ideation when an emergency team was called, suicidal, suicide ideation that was not an immediate threat but still considered extreme, consultations regarding self-harm, consultations when DCSF or the sheriffs were called because a student was in an unsafe environment at home. As can be gathered from the chart, our students have had 37 crises 
crisis incidents in the, in the 19 weeks of school so far this year, well more than any previous year's total from the entire school year. Um, and the chart kind of talk, you can see on the chart where in 13, 14, there were five crisis counseling data, um, five, five count, crisis counseling um, issues. And in, it goes up and down um, throughout the years, but in 2021, it's 37. So in the past two years, the number of counselors at TCHS has been reduced from six full-time counselors to the equivalent of 5.65 counselors as staff members split duties at other school sites. Plans have been discussed to bolster the counseling program in the form of a wellness center and another counseling position, possibly an LSW or MFT, but these positions are difficult to fill in a school district. These plans have not yet come to fruition and have not been listed on an agenda for quite some time. While I understand that these types of programs are addition or additions take time, I also know that our students are hurting right now. Our TCH counseling team has brainstormed many different methods to meet the mental health needs on our campus. We have truly agonized over how best to support our students. I believe that we are doing everything in our current capacity to address this emergency situation. Still, the crisis continues to overwhelm our efforts and our campus. The TCHS students and counseling program would benefit greatly from using some of the COVID relief funds to hire a temporary counselor, counselor, realign the duties of the current counselors, fund a mental wellness center, and or create a district committee to promote and implement mental wellness initiatives. During this pandemic, our district has considered and created committees, programs, new job positions, new educational purchases, and new policies to address needs relative to academics, technology, public health, and much more. And it was the right thing to do. Now, the most pressing and dire need our students are experiencing is connected to their mental wellness. In the same way we have acted quickly and decisively for the past two years, drastic measures need to be taken to address this crisis. Please know that I do not address. I please know that I do not address your, you tonight, thinking of myself, my job, or my hours put in. I speak to you as an advocate for the students who cannot. I speak to you on behalf of the young people who are in our office each week, expressing a desire to end their lives. I speak to you on behalf of teenagers that we see each day that are so overwhelmed by the stressors in their world that they have given up and feel numb. I speak to you on behalf of the students whose home lives have fallen apart and not recovered in the face of a global pandemic. On the behalf of all TCHS and TCUSD students, I ask you to consider the need to act now with compassion, purpose, and significance. Respectfully submitted Nathan Slaymaker and signed by, um, I believe we've got Nathan Slaymaker, Taylor Hudson, um, English teacher, Debbie Singh, counselor, Michael Shore, teacher, Kevin Slattery, science teacher, Anthony Russell, teacher, Shiomara uh, Cordova, office assistant, Lynn Alvarez, English teacher, Kendra Miller, English teacher, Lynn Greenup, TCHS school psychologist, Robin Sel Selders, teacher and parent of TCHS student, Don Neufeld, English teacher, Kelly Presley, or Priestley, special teacher. Uh, special ed teacher, Jessica Shunky, English teacher, Amy Sissons, College and Career Center, Tech, Mi, Mi, um, Mahi Kim, art teacher, Michael Liu, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing these names, English teacher, Florence Lee, math teacher, um, Anne-Marie Huang, science teacher, Ryan Lauterbach, economics teacher, Anthony Garcia, sports medicine teacher, Grant Rowe, teacher and parent, Wendy Van Thiel, English teacher, Vanessa Hadakusuma, English teacher, Sally Chen, English teacher, Layla Herman, English teacher, Save Liu, English teacher, Kristen Castro, counselor, Raul Acevedo. And there, it, I can, I'll, I'm almost done, I'll read them all. Philip Bailey, instrumental director, Marlo Antonio Tietz, um, tech support, Brianne Cruz, Spanish teacher, Reggie Rios, Dolores Lopez, um, DDSLC, both at DDSLC, 
Ann Lozier, special education and social studies teacher, Lyle Takashida, um, earth science teacher and varsity basketball for girls and boys golf, Brenda Pan, pet math teacher, long-term sub, uh, doesn't have the name, I can't read the signature, Kim Allen, CTE teacher, Mike, Michelle Gaffney, um, ELA slash VAPA, Brandon Rivas, teacher, Jeff Bogine, math teacher, Sarah Baham, ATP teacher, Marie, Marie, oh gosh, I know this name, Maria Ioli, counselor, because I, I was the last name, I, I was like, oh my God, how am I going to pronounce that? But yes, I remember. Uh, Sophia Gonzalez, uh, library media specialist. And that is what we have for written comments. Um, we'll move on to dis the discussion information item section of our agenda, which is item number 21, COVID-19 update from Dr. Fricker. Thank you very much. Um, and as Andy loads my presentation. I do want to update you on um, all things COVID as they continue to shift and change um, throughout the, the month of January here. I think that we've settled on you know, guidelines and stop the um, act, actual changing of guidelines from LADPH. Uh, so I did send out a message to um, the TCHS, the TCUSD family, and that would be our staff and our students and our parents uh, with regard to the latest COVID guidelines and the directions and how we will be uh, triaging cases and, um, you know, directing people for isolation periods or quarantine periods or abridged um, quarantine period. So, um, with that, we can move on. Andy, next slide. Um, so next one again. Okay. So, uh, this was a, a graph that I shared in the superintendent's forum. Uh, when, when we talked about just the different spikes in COVID that we have seen, uh, during similar times of the year. So in December of last year, we saw a pretty significant spike, um, as we were coming out of that, um, holiday season and it was just a shared time. People were getting together this year. We're seeing a larger spike. Like I said before in the forum, um, Omicron is transferable at greater rates and it is more infectious at greater rates. And so we've had to take and revert back to, uh, more extreme precautions in terms of keeping our staff and our students safe during this time. Uh, I think a lot of the preventative measures that we had put in place in the fall were very effective. We did have very low rates of transmission. Um, in some schools, we had zero transmission, um, on a campus. And so it was really important for us to maintain those guidelines and then um, make sure that we are being very diligent in how we are um, implementing those guidelines for the safety of our students and for the safety of our staff. We know it is a paramount and the message has been clear from the governor on down to our county office of ed that that you know students who have access to campus and have access to our um, phenomenal teachers have the greatest propensity to learn and that learning takes place in the classroom. So it is our job to make sure that our classrooms are safe, our teachers are safe, our students are safe, and that they do have that protected place to learn and grow uh, throughout the school year. So keeping them on ca campus is our best defense. Next 
Moving forward, we know that um, there are mask requirements. Masking is required indoors and outdoors. Uh, we have had that requirement here in Temple City the entire time. Uh, so that is nothing really new for us. Our staff is required to wear higher grade masks. Um, and so any surgical grade mask uh, that you see on the screen is acceptable. From the right hand of the screen, you have a basic grade surgical mask. Uh, the middle one would be a, a KN95 um, or an N95. And then over to the left, that would be a respirator type mask or a KN95 or a KF94. Um, all of those, those masks are acceptable um, and staff members can use them. They are distributed to our school sites and staff can have a replenished mask uh, whenever they do require one. Uh, we do hand them out and they are available. Um, physical distancing remains uh, to be a key component to combating uh, the spread of COVID. Masking and physical distancing are the two things that we can do every single day, uh, wherever we are, to make sure that we keep ourselves safe and we keep the, the members or people around us safe as well. We always say in Temple City that if you keep an arm length distance away, that's a measure stick that you have on your person all the time. And it's a good indication of how um, you should distance yourself from other people. I know that um, on our campuses, uh, we do stress uh, physical distancing as well as masking. And um, this has, has proven to be a great deterrent from transmission on campuses. We have had very low transmission rates um, on our school campuses, um, as Kiana had mentioned. We do post that on our website. We try to keep that up to date every single week. Um, cases in the county have risen significantly. Uh, cases for Temple City have risen, but they've not risen at the same rates that other districts have been experiencing them. So I will take your point, Kiana, and uh, make sure that if we can put a date marker of when it's been uh, updated, then people who will have a reference point. So thank you so much for that um, suggestion. We will keep that in mind and I will alert the team to uh, make that adjustment. Vaccinations, vaccinations, um, um, it's been said again and again and in many of the news reports that people have seen that vaccination rates uh, and vaccines are indeed effective. They do help the degree with which if you do come in contact with COVID and you do become ill, it does help with the degree to which you become ill. Most people with vaccinations and or boosters either have very low or mild symptoms of COVID if they do get COVID. Um, and in some cases, people who have been vaccinated and boosted have not gotten COVID. We do know that for the unvaccinated, this is a category of individual that the LADPH is most um, uh, worried about uh, because it is more likely that if you do have underlying symptomology of different uh, medical area and you're unvaccinated uh, that you could have a more serious form or more aggressive form of COVID uh, and that could have long lasting um, effects. So we do encourage vaccination, uh, two doses of Moderna or Pfizer and one dose or one dose of Johnson and Johnson. Boosters are available and we do have vaccine clinics, clinics that we run periodically um, at the district office. Uh, and we will have more to come uh, just for anybody who is in need of vaccination. Um, isolation and quarantine. Isolation is really for the people who are sick, um, testing positive and or being symptomatic. And either if you test positive or you are symptomatic, you must stay home and isolate. Uh, if you're symptomatic, uh, you should get a COVID test immediately. And then if that is positive, obviously stay home and isolate for the required amount of time. If it is negative, you can return to work or school. Uh, quarantining usually refers to those individuals who have been identified as a close contact to somebody who has tested positive for COVID. Um, for students and staff, it's a little bit different between LA County Department of Public Health guidelines, which primarily covers our students in K-12 environment. And we also incorporate OSHA in addition with LADPH to um, determine the uh, direction for staff. So for students, uh, vaccinated asymptomatic students can remain in school. Unvaccinated students who have had unmasked contact meaning one or both individuals were not wearing a mask, need to um, be quarantined and then have a test on day five uh, if they want to return or minimize that quarantine uh, amount. The, the virus usually runs a 10-day course. 
If you are asymptomatic on day five, you are eligible to take that test and then obviously come back to school. So you don't have to take, stay out the entire 10 days, uh, but that is only for asymptomatic uh, students. For staff vaccinated, asymptomatic staff, they will remain um, at work, but they do need to take a test on day five just to make sure that they do not have COVID in their system. Obviously, if they do, they would go on the isolation um, protocols and if they test negative on that day five, they can remain in work, not a problem. Um, for the unvaccinated um, staff, then it is important that they do quarantine uh, and they can take a test on day five to return to work after that five day period if they do remain asymptomatic. COVID testing, we have increased um, some of our COVID testing uh, at the district, district office. Um, it is located on um, 9,700 Las Tunas, right in the back part of our parking lot. Uh, we do have testing is a PCR test on Tuesday and Thursday. It's from 2 PM to three, uh, 2 PM to 6 PM. Um, and then we have opened up Saturday, uh, COVID-19 testing, PCR testing for anybody in the community. So Tuesday and Thursday is just for staff and students, but on Saturday, it's really open to the public, anybody, friends, family, um, can come and get tested should they need a PCR test for COVID. Uh, the, back, the COVID testing clinic is open from 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. And I just want to thank all of the people uh, in our risk management department and our district nurse, and then um, Albert, our custodian, who sets up and breaks down um, all of our testing and vaccination clinics um, and works in partnership with the city agencies uh, that help us put that on. So we couldn't do it without all of them, but it is, I just want to reiterate, Tuesday and Thursday is open to staff and students, and then Saturday is open to all community members. The rapid antigen test, as Kiana had mentioned, um, students who are sick at school, it's really important if you're showing signs and symptoms at school that we know if it's just an allergy or if it is you know, indeed COVID. So students who are sick at school, um, their, their parents will be called and they can be given uh, a COVID-19 test from their family. Um, test kits will be sent home with those students uh, so that they can test immediately to determine if they do have COVID or if they do not, um, they may want to test on day five just to make sure, and they will be given uh, test kits to do so. Uh, those test kits did come in. There are two test kits in a box, and they're meant to be taken immediately to determine if you do have COVID immediately and or on day five. Um, so there's, they're meant to be sequential tests so that you're sure that um, either you do not have the illness or you didn't develop the illness over those five days. Staff who are ill at work um, or at home and they are in need of a rapid antigen test to come back on that modified quarantine, as I spoke of before, on day five, you are eligible to come and get a rapid antigen test. Um, and those uh, individuals who um, also uh, are on quarantine, so maybe you are a close contact and you've been notified by our office that you're a close contact, but you are unvaccinated and you must remain at home, uh, you would also need a rapid antigen test to return to work. The goal uh, of the initial out, um, allocation of rapid antigen tests was to test our staff and student or test our student population, excuse me, before they came back to school in January. Well, we did not get those test kits before we in Temple City started in January. Um, some districts did. And so they did disseminate those tests as the governor intended, but we did not get those tests. We actually got them two weeks into the school um, resume, resuming. And so we did not get them in time. Uh, we did uh, speak to um, uh, our union representatives and the board president and a couple other individuals to determine, uh, including LADPH and Dr. Ferrer herself, to determine how we would disseminate um, the rapid antigen test. We do want to make sure that we are serving the people who need the test the most. We do understand that they are in short supply, uh, but we do want to make sure that they are getting out and getting distributed so that the primary amount of students can remain in school and our staff can remain at work. And so that is the most important thing uh, to make sure that our schools are open and functioning. So test kits um, have been delivered to all of the school sites. They are available. If people need a test kit, you please contact your school uh, administration and they will devise or they have um, devised a plan to disseminate those test kits to both staff and students who are in need. Um, we only have a limited supply of those test kits. 
we do have, um, many feelers out there as to where we can get resupplied, um, of those test kits. So they're not, um, inexpensive, but we do have some, uh, vendors who we are trying to work with to secure an ongoing supply. LA County department of public health and LACO are also trying to, um, garner additional rapid antigen test kits and pen and, um, have a partnership to have a supply chain to the districts that has not been put in place at this time, um, but we are hopeful through their efforts and our efforts that we can get um, a resupply of the test kits that we do have, and we can continue to have that supply in our district. But I will keep the board informed as to what those partnerships look like and when we can um, anticipate getting that stock replenished. So at this time, um, if there's any questions about the COVID updates, uh, information went out. There's flow charts um, that were included. They are translated in, in Mandarin and Spanish for our families, all of our LVNs, our principals, and our response staff here at the district office have been trained uh, to make sure that we are all updated on the new COVID protocols and guidelines and that we are implementing um, them to the greatest degree possible uh, in all of our school sites. So at this time, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Anybody have a question on the board? Just a quick comment. Just want to thank Dr. Fricker for, um, I mean, the comprehensiveness of this presentation, the amount of work that you put in, especially when um, the Department of Health has been changing these guidelines midstream um, and with the limited supplies of, you know, rapid antigen tests, um, also PCR tests coming back late, you mm -hmm. know, many days later. And then, of course, I can only vicariously imagine how sites, uh, principals and teachers and you as a superintendent getting phone calls from families, like, what do you mean my child was exposed five days ago when I'm just being notified now that, you know, things like that. Um, just it, the work that, that you're doing is above and beyond. And this is, um, I'm so appreciative. Um, just, you know, hang in there a little bit longer because this surge is heading down. We look at the South Africa um, data um, it went up really quickly and it went down equally fast. So we are you know, turning that corner right now and it's heading down. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Member Sneed. Um, I wanna thank you also, um, you and um, Maria Montgomery and uh, Crystal, our district nurse for all the extra hours you've been putting in on weekends and nights and making contact with the families. Um, the one slide that you had there explaining how you're going, going to distribute the um, rapid tests, I think it's a great idea. It, almost, it gives our, our students and staff, um, I wanna say a ticket back into school mm -hmm. um, if they've tested positive, this gives them a, a pathway back into the classroom. And I, I think that's really important because as Mike just mentioned, some of the uh, the other tests, I think they've caught up. I think when Mari said the uh, labs have caught up mm -hmm. a bit, but um, mm -hmm. it still takes quite a few days. Um, my two of my grandkids went through that situation. So um, the rep, I'm glad we're distributing the rapid tests out. So um, our students and staff have a way to get back to class after they've quarantined. So thank you for all the efforts you've been putting in. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay, so with that, we will move on to the discussion action portion of the agenda. And um, under administration, we have item number 22, adoption of resolution 2122-18, recognizing a state of emergency and reauthorizing teleconferencing meetings pursuant to AB 361. We've had this on our agenda every month. And so I don't know that we have to have a conversation about it, but Kim, is are you good with that description? I am good with it. Okay, good. All right. May I get a motion and a second? I would like to move the motion. I'll move. Okay. So <laughs> member Lynn uh, motioned, member Georgino seconded. Um, let's go ahead and take the vote and then we'll do a discussion. Um, mem I'm a yes. Member Smith? Student. Yeah. Oh, yes. sorry. Yes. Pre preferential vote. Student board member Lee. Yes. All right. I'm a yes. 
Member Smith? Yes. Member Giorgino? Yes. Member Sneed? Yes. And Member Lynn? Yes. Okay. Motion passes 5 0. Um, is there any discussion about this? Okay. We will move on. All right. Item number 23, adoption of resolution 2122 19, proclaiming February 7th through 11th, 2022, as week of the counselor. Um, may I get a motion? I'd like to make that motion. Okay. Um, that was Member Smith motion and Member Sneed seconded. Uh, we will go ahead and take a vote and then, oh wait, no, after a motion, then we move um, any discussion, then we take the vote, sorry. So any discussion? I would say it should be the year of the council. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> I agree. Definitely. All right, preferential vote, student board member Lee. Yes. All right. Member Lynn? Yes. Member Sneed? Yes. Member Giorgino? Yes. Member Smith? Yes. And I'm a yes. That motion passes 5 0. All right. Moving on to 24A, we are um, asking for the approval of the opening of a public hearing to gather input on potential trustee area maps. Um, may I get a motion and a second? I'll move. A okay. second. Okay, member Giorgino motion, member Smith seconded. Um, we do the discussion after the vote to open the session, right? Yes. Okay, so we'll do um, the vote, preferential vote from student board member Lee. Yes. Okay. Member Giorgino? Yes. Member Smith? Yes. Member Sneed? Yes. Member Lynn? Yes. Okay, and I'm a yes. So the public hearing is now open um, with a vote of 5-0 at 9.04 p.m. Kim, did you wanna discuss anything on this? We actually asked Scott Tarlucci here yeah. to do a presentation. Oh, good. Yeah, there'll be a small presentation. All right, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to share my screen if that's all right. Yes. And I will do a quick presentation to kind of recap what we've done previously and then get us going here. So um, as you know, we're transitioning to trustee areas from an uh, at-large district. Uh, thank you very much for having me here and then allowing me to speak. Um, just a quick brief overview of the trustee transition process. Just wanna remind everybody um, in the audience and, and board members that does not affect school boundaries nor student enrollment at all. This is just for the trustees on who can vote for which trustees and where they live. So um, when we do this, um, we have to have some primary considerations when we take a district like yours that don't have trustees and split it up into trustee areas. So we're gonna split it up into five trustee areas to match your five trustees that you have now. The primary considerations are complying with CVRA, the California Voting Rights Act, and uh, that's to achieve population equity as near as possible. Um, and it's total population, not citizens nor voters. And it's based on the 2020-20 census and the California adjusted uh, census data. So the total population per the census was approximately was 35,669 um, people in uh, the Temple City Unified School District boundaries. Um, so that average is about 7,200 per trustee areas. That's like a target that we're going to look for when I'm when we're doing these trustee areas. Um, and each trustee area must be less than 10% between the smallest to the largest. So if you have a trustee that is 2% less than 
the 7,200, the largest can only be about 8% over 7,200. So that keeps it within that range. Secondary considerations, of course, it has to comply with all federal voting rights acts and laws. Um, cracking and packing are prohibited. Uh, the voting districts try to make them as geographically contiguous and compact as possible. And you're allowed to use um, existing administrative lines, um, roads, streets, whatever the census blocks. Um, maintain local communities of interest. So it's not just necessarily race, but it could be language. It could be uh, similarities in a rural or agriculture or a type of, of uh, housing. So you want to maintain that or just a, a community, uh, you know, a certain community area, a downtown versus a suburban. And the location of the incumbents may be considered, but can't be a sole factor. So just a quick overview of the demographics. Um, Temple City USD is approximately, like I said, 36,000 population with about 63%, 63.5% Asian. Um, 18.1% is Hispanic and about 14.4% is white. So that's the, the general mix of the populations. The other demographic, one of the other things we look at is the Cali California voting age population. So within that same area, um, what this is, is this is actually registered California voters. There's approximately 22,820 California registered voters. Um, and with that, that's 57.8% is Asian. 1.7% uh, is, is uh Black, um, Hispanic is 16% and white is 22.7%. So that's the general demographic breakdown of the district. So when we're creating these new trustee areas, we have to use census block data. Again, this is the data that is from the 2020 census. It was released in September of 2021 and it is adjusted for the state of California, by the state of California, um, to place incarcerated population back in their home area. Um, that's where the, the population data comes from and the ethnicity information. The American Community Survey gives us the citizens voting age population. This is actually based on surveys done 2015 to 2019 it's the voting age population. It's used as a reference to, to make sure that, that we have equity across all the districts and all, all the areas. And then, as I mentioned, we have to use the census blocks. This is the smallest lens, uh, level of census geography. Um, it's based upon visible features along with non-visible features. They're adjusted every 10 years with the, um, with the census. Uh, some of them can be kind of funny looking. Uh, like the one I've highlighted here, it's it's got a almost a Pac-Man look to it or something, where it's got a uh, and then it's got a tail at the bottom. So you might see some strange um, looking boundaries, and that's because we're within the constraints of what the actual trustee areas are. Uh, or I'm sorry, what the actual census blocks are. So I have to, we have to use that to create these trustees areas. So with that, I created three scenarios, um, creatively call them scenario A, B, and C, uh, using different criteria, let's say. What I first wanted to do is create a scenario, and this is scenario A, and it's based on looking at the um, elementary attendance areas. What I so the elementary attendance areas are the dark um, black lines. The shaded areas are the trustee areas. So what this is do, did was break um, the trustee areas. Like trustee area two has a single is part of a portion of a single attendance area. Um, Trustee area one and trustee area three split another attendance area and trustee area five and trustee area four also split attendance areas. Now, some of the issues with this, and I show the, the population, I'm 
we can go into that if you'd like, but it's just a lot of numbers. And if, if we want to um, really go into it, we can. But the lawyers looked at this and they all look as um, equal as possible. But some of the issues that I've come up with and, and, and uh, wanted to try different scenarios, not only to give you choices and give the public choices, but also that this max variance is 8.4%. So that's really close to that 10%. And also um, some of where the uh, current trustees are living might get grouped two or three within one of the trustee areas on this. And each trustee is only um, being part of their and representing one school, even though you're representing the district as a whole, the people only from one school are getting a chance to vote for you. So from that, I decided to create, try to get really the variance down as close to zero as possible. Oh, and the other the other issue with this one is that green area, trust area two, that may be considered non-contiguous because there's no flow between the two. So I was I was concerned about that and that may lead to um, you know any type of problem. So that that's why I've decided to come up with two other scenarios. So with these two other scenarios, I've just took what I had started with and spread it out a little bit. Trustee area two, and now is uh, spread over two areas. Trustee area one goes and flows down into that southern area um, and actually has is in three different attendance areas. Each trustee area is in multiple attendance areas, so they're not just having population from one attendance area vote for them that have a population from at least two in each one of these. And I brought the max variance down to 2.8%. So this was a, a, I feel a successful chart change and a successful attempt to uh, get this correct or get this as a, as a evenly distributed as uh, possible. But I always like to try one more. So I did trustee area C, same idea as trustee area B, or scenario B, but this has got a max variance of 0.9%. And you can see on the left side that there's the variance between the population ranges from 31 above to 35 below. They're right in line with each other. They're very, very close to each other. So with that, um, I am open to any questions to the board. And then, of course, the process here now is to get board input and to get the public input and then maybe come back with a, a revised scenario if that's what we, uh, we need and uh, go from there. Uh, thank you very much, and I'll stop sharing my screen now and and answer any questions and then look forward to the input. Thank you, Scott. Well, let's start with um, any input uh, from the public. Do we have any input from the public? Uh, No, I don't see any comments. Okay. Um, board members, do we have any input from board members? Donna? Um, I'd really like to get some input from the community. So I wonder if, uh, I know we have it, well, it'll be on the agenda for the next two meetings. If we could really do a big push to try to get the word out. Um, maybe like in the school newsletters and the superintendent's newsletters. I notice on the website, it says uh, CRV and I'm not sure people know what that means. So whatever we could do to make people understand what's going on and if they wanna give comment on it that they can. Great idea. Um, Member Smith, you had your hand up. Um, I'll withhold further comment. <laughs> You sure? Uh, yeah. Well, you know what? I'll, yeah, I'll just say this. I, I know that uh, scenario A has the greatest variance, but it makes the most sense to me. I don't know if I'm seeding, trying to seed something or what, but uh, the, the match 
for Emperor is almost perfect with uh, the green. The matches for the um, La Rosa and um, Cloverly, when you combine those two companion school areas, matches perfectly. It's not so good for Longden, but you know, I, I, it looks the cleanest to me, to be very honest. I'll just leave it at that. All comments are appreciated. Anybody else? Okay, so let's then move on to item number 24B to approve the closing of the public hearing um, to gather input on the trustee areas. Can I get a motion and a second? Moved. Okay. Member Smith motions, any second? Second. Member Lynn seconds. Um, we can go ahead and go to the vote. Um, preferential vote from student board member Lee. Yes. Okay. Um, member Sneed. Yes, I had to unmute myself. Okay. And member Smith. Yes. Member Lynn. Yes. I'm a yes. And member Georgino. Yes. Okay. We have now closed the public hearing effective nine at nine eighteen. Thank you for your input, and we'll look forward to continuing this discussions at our next meetings. All our right. Next Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. All right. We'll move on to educational services. Item number 25, approval of updated 2020-2021 school accountability report cards. And I believe Christopher Holmes is going to talk about this, or do we need... Oh, well, let's get a motion first. Um, motion and a second. I'm Member on. Lynn? I'll move. Okay. Um, I, Member um, Lynn is the motion, gets the motion, and Member Georgina will get the second. Um, do we need um, any discussions on this topic? It's an annual thing, I know that. I Do we want to just have Chris give us a little explanation for the public? Sure. Yeah. Uh, so since November of 1988, state law has required that schools receiving state funding to prepare and distribute, it requires that these schools prepare and distribute a SARC. It's connected to Proposition 98. Um, a similar requirement is also contained in the Federal Elementary and Secondary Education Act. The purpose of the report card is to provide parents in the community with important information about each school. Although um, there is variation in the design of report cards, they generally, they generally begin with a profile that provides background information and also includes demographic data, school safety and climate for learning information, academic data, school completion rates, class sizes, teacher and staff information, curriculum and instruction descriptions, post-secondary preparation information, and fiscal and expenditure data. And schools are required to update this report annually and submit it to the CDE by February 1st. So all of our school site principals completed their reports and they are provided to you now. Any questions for Chris? I had a question. Uh, where did the uh, looking through the the um, the reports this afternoon, especially for the elementary schools, where is TK? Where are the TK? Where is TK listed? Is that listed as part of the kindergarten numbers? Or I noticed that the schools that have TK classes, there is no indication of what their numbers were. You know, that's a good question, uh, Member Sneed, and I'm going to have to get back to you on that one. I'm not certain as to if the TK numbers uh, were just embedded in the kinder numbers. I want to verify that for you. Okay. Thank you. I think they would have been because TK is considered the first year of a two-year kinder program. Okay. Um, so it should be there. Now, when they move to um, early TK or we're putting those four-year-olds in, I think those, um, the state is going to have to recalibrate because that right. would be an additional amount of students coming in. And normally it, it is four instead of five. Okay. Thank you. 
I, I just want to share that, you know, the data comes from doc tracking, which is, um, has become a cottage industry. They populate that data based on what the district reports to the state and the district uses ARIES and TK is a kindergarten, considered kindergarten. It's a two year kindergarten program. Okay, thank you. All right, with that, we can um, move to the vote. Um, I'm sorry. Uh -huh. I'm so sorry oh, did you that. have some questions too? Yeah, just one, a few questions okay. uh, for Mr. Holmes. Um, so I was reading the percentage of students meeting or exceeding the state standard on the CAASPP standardized testing. And I noticed that we don't have a lot of results for that, for example, for La Rosa. And I was wondering if it's because maybe in the past years because of the pandemic, we haven't been taking them or is there another reason why we don't have the results for the standardized testing? So we shouldn't have CASP testing as we did not take the CASP last year. So we did not take mm -hmm. the state standardized test. Um, go right ahead. Sorry, Kiana. Oh, no, no, that's it. I, I, I oh, okay. yes. Thank you. Anything else? All right. Preferential vote from student board member Lee. Yes. Um, yes. Member Lynn? Yes. Member Smith? Yes. Member Sneed? Yes. Member Giorgino? Yes. All right. Item number 25 passes with a 5-0 vote. Um, moving on to business services, item number 26, approval of the grant application for No Kid Hungry School Nutrition. Um, do we have a recap or uh, some highlights about this one? What, you want a motion and a second? Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, motion, um, can I get a motion and a second? Dr. Lynn, motion. okay. Second? I'll second. second. All right, member Sneed, second. second. Um, all right, now any discussion about this one? Connie, do you have anything? Yeah, thank you for board approval to uh, authorize us apply this uh, funding. The purpose of this funding is maximize the child nutrition program as well as the other emergency food program to ensure that the kids in our community have the access to healthy meals during school time and at home during the summer and in this difficult time. So the funding is average application is $10,000 and the deadline for application is the end of this month. And we plan to use the funding if we successfully awarded to use funding to purchase equipment so that we can use new equipment to support our new program launch next school year for the new breakfast. Any questions? I'd just like to make a comment, I guess. Um, I was enthusiastic when I read the title of this grant, and then I saw it was only ten thousand dollars. That's nothing. But that's why we'll take what we can get. That's why. Student board member Lee. Thank you, President Smith. Um, Miss Wu, I was just wondering if this is our first year applying for this grant, or have we applied for this in the past? So um, I believe that uh, for the child nutrition program, there was a uh, uh, various grant available and uh, either, either from state and the local. And this is a grant that we are aware of right now and our director will um, work very hard to apply. And we also want, do not want to miss any opportunity. So we will try, but sometimes the grant, they are targeted low income community. So that means that if we try, we were able to get it because they have their grant award priority. So th thank you for your um, question. But yes, in every opportunity we have, we will try. We will give it a try. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? All right. Let's go ahead and go for the vote. Preferential vote from student board member Lee. Yes. Um, member Giorgino? Yes. Member Sneed? Yes. Member Lynn? Yes. I'm a yes. And Member Smith? Yes. 
All right, that passes 5-0. Moving on to item number 27, consideration of approval for, um, is that school year 2022-23 annual renewal of services, super co-op joint powers of authority. Uh, may I get a motion and a second? I'll move. Um, George, member Giorgino has motioned. Second. I'll second. Nope. Member Lynn, second. Um, all right. Connie, do you have any description on this one? Sure. I um, just pro want to provide more information for the board. Um, the continued membership will allow us to continue access the different resources. The JPA, the Super Crop JPA, we will pull the purchasing power. So the district like our size were able to access much more resources and get to technical support as well as administrative support, such as contract for USDA food, food service and real service. So it's definitely very supportive for our district. And the membership is not that expensive. It's less than $600. So I think it's worth the price we pay. Okay. Any questions? For... Connie. Okay, let's go ahead and take the vote. Preferential vote, student board member Lee? Yes. Okay. Um, uh, member Lynn? Yes. Member Sneed? Yes. Member Smith? Yes. Member Giorgino? Yes. And I'm a yes, so that motion passes 5-0. We'll move on to item number 28, uh, approval of the 2020-2021 annual developer fee report. Uh, may I get a motion and a second? So moved. Member, so Smith, moved. member Smith motion, member Giorgino seconds. Um, any description that we have on this one? Yes, uh, the approval of the board about the report for the 2021 annual development fee is meet the requirement of the government code section 66001 and 6006 require us to provide such report at a certain amount of time after close of year at a, a regular board meeting. So at the code section 17260, provide guidelines for public school to levy and assess the issuance of the building permit. So we are authorized to collect from the owners of the residential and the commercial development project within the city's boundary. The fee collect the purpose to mitigate the cost of construction within the school district. So our district, we um, hire consultant to regularly do the fee justification study. So effective October 1st, 2020, our fee is $4.08 per square foot for the residential construction, 66 cents per square foot for the commercial construction. So during the 2021 school year, the district collected $217,561.96 and we also um, have the interest earned our balance is over $10,538.29, which means that by the end of June 30, 2021, the district have a total fund balance a little bit over $2 million. During the last school year, the district spent $9,033.03 for the project on the DDSLC um, facilities. I believe that uh, probably we move that uh, camp school, move that um, camp school to the high school. So that's the cost for that project. Okay, any questions? Donna? I have a question. Um, Connie, I, we brought in over 200,000 uh, last year. I was just wondering, how, do you know how that compares with previous years, considering last year we were in a pandemic? So um, um, I would like to bring the information to you later. Um, I don't have that information on hand right now. Do you mind I will send it to uh, Dr. Fruger so she can include it in the week update? Oh, sure, sure, no problem. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Connie. 
Yeah, that would be actually interesting for us to know if you want to get it to the board members. Um, Member Smith, you wanted to say something? I just had a question. I think, I'm trying to recall, I think we can only increase or change the developer fees like every two or three years. Is that right? That's correct. Because uh, um, every January, which we are anticipated um, this year, every two years, the state will have a new revised fee for residential and commercial. So what uh, our district did, which I, I will, um, I really cool to this practice, uh, once we received the update fee from state, then the district will um, have the consultant to uh, review our concentration to see whether there's a justification for us to our fee in align with the state. So we are anxious uh, uh, to waiting for the new fee. And then after that, uh, the consultant actually, we have uh, um, existing agreement with uh, the consultant and then they already contact my office. So uh, once the fee released and we'll work, work to a consultant to update the fee we have right now. So that'll be later this year. Like That's correct. Summertime. Okay, great, thank you. Any other questions? All right, let's move to the vote. A preferential vote for student board member Lee? Yes. Okay, I'm a yes. Uh, member Giorgino? Yes. Member Lynn? Yes. Member Smith? Yes. And Member Sneed? Yes. Okay, now we will move on to human resources. Um, item number 29, approval of amendment to the superintendent's employment agreement. And that is, um, I'll be talking about that, but let's go ahead and get a motion and a second. I move. Okay, member Sneed moves and seconded by member Smith. Yeah. Okay. Um, let me go ahead and I have some readout language for this. Um, Presented to the board for approval is an amendment to the current agreement with Dr. Fricker, which sets forth the terms and conditions of her employment as the district's superintendent. The purpose of this amendment is to correct and to clarify the superintendent's base annual salary for the term of the agreement. Pursuant to government code section 54953 subdivision C3, the following is a summary of the recommendation for final action. The amendment corrects and clarifies that the superintendent's base annual salary effective July 1st, 2021 is 257,211.96. Effective July, 20, July 1st, 2022 and every subsequent July 1st for the term of the agreement, the superintendent's base annual salary shall automatically increase by $5,000. Additionally, the superintendent shall automatically receive the same total percentage increase or decrease to her compensation pa package, including salary and benefits that is applied to the district's certificated management, including the assistant superintendents. Finally, the superintendent is eligible for, for and shall receive the same annual stipend for her doctorate degree commensurate with the board policy. The remainder, the remainder of the agreement approved at the September 8th, 2021 meeting, and as amended at the October 13th, 2021 meeting shall remain unchanged. Okay. Any questions about that? All right, let's move to the vote. Preferential vote from student board member Lee. Yes. Okay. Um, member Sneed. Yes. Member Smith? Yes. I'm a yes. Member Giorgino? Yes. And Member Lynn? Yes. Okay, that motion passes 5-0. Now we move on to consent agenda, which is routine items approved by one motion and one vote, unless a member of the board or audience requests that any item be reviewed and voted upon separately. Um, do we have anybody that wants to Pull one before we get into it. Okay. All right. So may I have a motion and a second? I'll move. Okay. Motion by D member Giorgino. Second, I saw Dr. Lynn. Sure. Second. Okay. Um, 
Any discussion? Actually, I have one question. I'm sorry, I didn't think to alert anybody in advance. But um, on the contracts page, page one of two, there's a, an amount of $100,000 for adult ed block grant. Is that a pass through? Is that coming from PCC or some other place? Maybe we have Connie to address that one. So I'm looking at the which pages? Uh, page one of two, which is actually the third page back. And it's the, the one, two, three, fourth from the top. It says uh, SEI Security Education Institute, $100,000. And I was wondering if that was a pass through or is that coming out of our school district budget? Okay. Um, I, I believe it's come from school district um, budget. I think this is a program, the uh, program, the security training program and the, the uh, adult education want to handle. And they are, um, through the training, there is a revenue we can collect through the local agency. So we are working on, uh, I believe we are working on a signed special agreement so that uh, um, there is a, um, LA County, there is uh, the grant. So every time the district have a training and then job replacement, depend on the number of the students uh, we are found, help them find a job, then we will get uh, paid the revenue from the uh, county and uh, depend on number of students. So I believe that's the revenue in the tide of this expenditure. So yes, can I just clarify further? So yes, County is correct. Um, it does come out of this adult school budget. It doesn't come out of our general fund budget. So it does come out of the adult school budget. Um, and it is to pay for content curriculum and classes in security that the adult school provides for community members. And yes, it is connected to a corporation called iTrain. Um, and it is a federal and state organization that helps um, community members become eligible for employment opportunities in the area of security. Uh, but it is out of that adult school pot of money um, that we get through that consortium, um, not through our general plan. Okay, thank you. Okay. We had the motion by member Giorgino, the second by member Lynn. Um, let's go ahead and move to the vote. Preferential vote from student board member Lee. Yes. Okay. Member Giorgino? Yes. Member Sneed? Yes. Member Smith? Yes. Member Lynn? Yes. And I'm a yes, so that motion passes 5 0. Um, now we move on to board requests or comments. Item number 39, board comments. Any, I'm sorry, go ahead, uh, member Giorgino. Yeah. Real, real quick, I just wanted to go back to the um, discussion about the trustee areas and uh, let everybody know that whatever we decide we're gonna be stuck with for 10 years. So if people have comments or concerns, um, now's the time to speak up and let us know. Absolutely, it's a super important thing and we welcome everybody's comments. Member Sneed. Um, I just wanted to say that the last couple of weeks have been pretty um, hard on the district. And it really brought home the fact that um, we have a pretty unique district. We have a pretty unique town. And the way the community has come together to um, surround the three families who are going through this tragedy, but just to support each other, support the students and, uh, that are affected by this. But it really brought home the fact that we really are a, giant, a big family and uh, a community that cares about each other and a village that is looking out for each other. So I'm real proud of how, um, of what Temple City and what our district has done in the last week, last couple of weeks. It's been a, it's been a hard couple of weeks. Definitely. Thank you for your comments, Member Sneed. Anybody else? 
Okay, let's move on to item number 40, which is future agenda items. Does anyone have any future agenda items? I have a couple. Um, one, I think we already have addressed because uh, I heard it, but just want to make sure that for our next meeting that we can get on the agenda, the counseling needs strategy. Um, and then the other one that I want to somehow have on one of our agendas is um, goes back to the LACO letter that I read. Um, really, really would like to understand what strategies are we em employing or even thinking about employing to slow or stop declining enrollment because without students, we don't have a school district. <laughs> so um, it's really important when you look at those numbers and you see by 2024, we're gonna, we potentially could be down to 4,000 something students. Um, uh, I'd like to see what we can do to try and slow that decline or stop it. It's, it's going to take innovation, um, new ideas, change, and, and all of that. So um, if we could put that on agenda item, that would be great. Uh, student board member Lee. Thanks, President Espinosa. Um, I realized that I forgot to bring it up when we were approving the essay. SARCs earlier tonight, um, but I was reading them over and I, first of all, I wanted to commend La Rosa because I noticed that uh, in their, the rate of the, the rating of their overall facility. So out of exemplary, good, fair, and poor, exam, um, La Rosa actually, their facility actually scored an exemplary. However, the high school, we scared, a, we scored a fair. And I was wondering, and <laughs> to me, that sounded a little bit interesting because from, from two different schools at the same district, I thought that it was interesting that we have such a d drastic difference in our overall facility rate uh, rating. And I was wondering is, um, is it, I know we're currently fixing and working on fixing the HBAC system at the media center at the library, uh, at the high school. But I was wondering uh, if currently is that, and then not in the board, but in the district agenda item to improve the facilities at the high school? I think I guess through the master, the master um, planning, there's a presentation about master planning. And mm -hmm. I think that's where we will find out what the recommendations are related to that. So that is, that could be, that's going to be a future agenda item because we the definitely, so appreciate the feedback um, and we'll put that on there. Thank you. Uh, anything else? Okay. Let's go on to item number 41, which is additional public comment on agendized, non-agendized items. Do we have any? No more, no comments. Okay. Um, we'll move on then to adjournment item number 42. Please note that we will be um, adjourning in the memory of the TCUSD students and in Bay, Eric Gullickson and Nicholas Torres. May I have a motion and a second? So moved. I'll move. Okay. So we have a motion from member Giorgino, a second from member Smith. Um, let's go ahead and move to the vote, preferential vote from student board member Lee. Yes. Okay, member Lynn. Yes. Member Espinoza, me, I will say yes. Member Giorgino. Yes. Member Sneed? Yes. And Member Smith? Yes. All right. That